I'm MC Toon, and it's Tuesday night. Tonight, I've got Big Blue, Blue Marble Science, talking about his Cavendish experiment. And I've got, as a uh, an additional inquisitor, to ask questions, I've got Kyle Adams. How are you two doing? Doing well. Excellent. Doing great. Doing great. How are you doing, Toon? I am fantastic. It's a good night. And uh, I, I'm excited for this. Blue has been working. You've been working on this particular thing for a long time. So I'm excited to see it. I have <laughs> I have not followed. I have to admit, I've not followed along very closely. So uh, people are saying, blimey, that was loud. Sorry. I've not followed too closely. Uh, but, uh, but I'm really excited to see what you've got here. So... Um, <clears throat> You have uh, you have a little bit you want to talk about, and so I thought I'd let you go, and and I'll bring up some uh, if if you go through things, I'll try to bring up some visual aids as you go. So why don't you just uh, introduce yourself and and the whatever you were um, thinking about the going to cover. Sound good? Yeah. Okay. Well, we can do that. Um, some of you know me. Some of you don't. I'm Blue Marble. So Clients. I do an occasional video, but for the last, uh, oh, I guess 18 months or more, uh, I got myself involved in, in doing a, a, re, a repeat of the Cavendish experiment. Um, Henry Cavendish, if, if you don't know who he was, was a guy that lived in the 17th century. He was born about 1731, I think. Uh, was a member of the uh, Royal Society of London. And the thing he's most noted for is an experiment he did in, in, in his own words to determine the density of the earth. Okay. Um, I'll give you a little background on, on Cavendish. He was kind of a strange fellow. Uh, his father, a guy by the name of uh, Lord Charles Cavendish, Originally, uh, early in his in his life, was more, more involved in politics. But uh, as time went on, he got more involved in, in physics, and was a member of the Royal Society of London. And that was kind of the uh, you know, premier uh, science group, I guess, of the anywhere on the planet at that time. Uh, Henry uh, Cavendish, uh, and that's that's who we're talking about. Uh, was actually uh, elected into the Royal Society in 1760. Now, a lot of people don't know much about Henry Cavendish. Uh, and I certainly didn't know some of these things until uh, um, getting into this experiment, actually. Uh, but when you look into his background, Henry was involved in all kinds of th things. The guy was, I think, autistic. He was certainly asocial, that's for sure. And a lot of his work uh, went unreported by him just because he avoided contact with people uh, to a, a, a pretty great degree. Uh, but he did become a member of the Royal Society, and uh, he is generally credited as being the, uh, the guy who discovered uh, hydrogen. He called it uh, inflammable air. Uh, he figured out uh, he figured that out by uh, combining certain metals and certain acids uh, to produce hydrogen gas, uh, and he was the first guy that correctly guessed that hydrogen was a uh, two-part constituent in water. Um, he also did things like uh, producing carbon dioxide and a bunch of other gases, and he measured specific gravities and solubilities in water and all kinds of things uh, that we don't generally think of Henry Cavendish as having done, but he nonetheless was, uh, uh, was involved in those things. A um, hundred years or so, almost a hundred years after he died, uh, actually James Clerk uh, Maxwell went through a lot of Henry's uh, papers and things and realized that a whole lot of things that, that were credited to other people had actually been done by Cavendish. Um, things like uh, 
uh, Ohm's law of all things, uh, electrical law, was uh, was a, a product of, of some work that Cavendish did. He came up with really what we call Charles' law and Boyle's law, uh, and principles of electrical conductivity, just all kinds of stuff. But of course, his most famous work uh, is this uh, Cavendish experiment that he published in the uh, the Royal Society proceedings in 1798. And it describes uh, a device that was uh, that's called a torsion balance that was used to that he used to determine what the density of the Earth is. Okay. Um, now the way that came about, Cavendish didn't really have the idea, and he fully credits uh, a gentleman by the name of Reverend John Michelle as having been the guy that came up with this idea of building a torsion balance that could make these measurements. But Michelle was never able to complete the, uh, the experiment. And shortly before his death, Michelle passed the experiment along. It was apparently mostly constructed, I think. He passed it along to uh, another guy by the name of uh, Wallison. I think that's right. Uh, I'm doing this just from memory now, but I think Wollaston was the fellow. Wollaston didn't have the the uh, uh, the upper, the uh, uh, a place where he could actually do it, so he passed it to Cavendish, and that's how Cavendish got his hands on it. Cavendish didn't like some of the things Michelle had done. He wasn't totally happy with some of the physical arrangements of the. Uh, of the equipment. So he pretty much uh, just totally redesigned it, rebuilt it. And uh, it took him, I don't know, the better part of two years, I think, to construct this thing and run all the tests. Not a, a length of time, not unlike what I've gone through, really. Uh, but that's, uh, that's sort of the background of it. Uh, from... Um, From that point, I guess what we ought to do maybe is try to describe this thing and and physically how it works for those who who aren't familiar with it. Have you got the uh, the paper there? I do, yeah. <laughs> Let me uh, let's get it up here. All right, so here is I'm um, showing. So if you, uh, I'm showing the first page of your paper that has the, uh, the, the torsion wire hanging down. And are you yeah. watching the, the stream so you can see it? I've got my, uh, I've got my copy of, of that thing open. Okay. Yeah. So I've got can, the first one. Yeah, Ky I, can, I, can flip back for <laughs> I can share it if you need Kyle, um, to see it. I'll tell you what, how much delay we, I'll, I'll how much delay we got? It's not much good if the if the audience can't see it though. Yeah, yeah. Well, then, yeah, I I will switch it. Uh, so. Oh, there you go. Yeah. So that's there. good. Yeah. Let's do it. There. All right. Let's do it that way. Yeah. Yeah. Now the audience can uh, can see it. Uh, I apologize for this. Uh, uh, the sketch it's just something i grabbed off the internet that's okay so uh, we've got uh, a bar with two spherical weights on it uh that can yeah. freely move around right and they're yeah. from this wire of some sort and we've got yeah. two other weights on both sides of the thing uh is that right the we've got right. the light green and then the dark green the light green are not attached right. to the dark green at all whatsoever and we're trying to uh, see if the dark green balls will be attracted to the light green balls. Is that right? No, actually, the dark green balls, the light green balls and the dark green balls are actually the same ones. They're just showing them in two different positions. Oh, okay. The, yeah, uh, the, that's the purple. The purple that, okay. Yeah, the big purple balls are the ones doing the attracting. Okay. Okay. And that's really the whole idea behind the torsion balance. It acts just exactly like 
a gravity pendulum, a, ver a vertical pendulum, except this one is horizontal. Instead of oscillating uh, left and right, uh, like a, a grandfather clock, you know, pendulum would do, this thing rotates. So it takes Earth's gravity out of the picture, right? That's Earth's gravity didn't have any effect on, on the twisting of this thing. The only thing making it twist is the attraction of those large masses, the large weights, the big purple balls. So uh, um, if the balls are at equal distance between each of the two purple balls, uh, would they just not move, just stay the, where, exactly where they're at? Because there's an uh, equal amount of force between the two of them going both ways. I've noticed that this uh, one, um, it, it, it's not quite a, a perfect starting point Ugh. does that make sense uh, they're both a little closer to one ball than the other one they're not exactly equal equal starting position yeah the the, the sketch may not be uh, may not be totally accurate i think you'll see uh see maybe in the uh go ahead to the next to the next uh Here. sketch let's look at that one okay uh, so okay. yeah we're seeing uh, that it's got now like we're a, looking down a, now we're few. looking down on it okay and the uh, imagine that the uh, the large blue uh, balls or start out vertically. Okay, just imagine that they're 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 vertical instead of cocked over to the side like they are like they're showing here. So when they're vertical, they're equal distant from the two blue the small blue balls, right? So the original starting happened. position is at ninety degrees or less than ninety degrees from. Yeah. Yeah, the original position would be with them like at 90 degrees, okay? And then you move the big balls into the position that you see them in right now, and the little blue balls will rotate from the blue position to the red position. And then when you swap, okay, if you rotate those big balls to the other side, just spin them uh, essentially 180 degrees, not quite, uh, then the attraction is opposite. Then, then the, 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 the torsion balance will swing the other direction. Instead of spinning clockwise, it'll spin counterclockwise. Does that make sense? Uh, I think so. It'll be a little easier to see it when the actual experiment's going. Yeah, probably so. So that's the idea. Um, that's what a that's what a torsion balance does, and again, it acts like a pendulum, and that's that's a that's a handy thing because we can measure the period of oscillation of it, and from the period of oscillation, we can determine what the torsion constant is, and from that, we can figure out how much force is being applied to it, and. By well, we need the period of oscillation, and we need the amount of deflection, how far the little balls move. So, you know, in in a nutshell, that's that's what the thing comes down to. It's a really very very simple device. Um, there's not a lot to it, but it's a very difficult measurement to make, and it's difficult because the forces involved are so so tiny. The force that's causing that torsion balance to, to move is the equivalent of the weight of about a, a piece of paper about one millimeter square if you can imagine that take a piece of just a piece of notebook paper and cut a one millimeter by one millimeter little little tiny sliver of that paper and weigh that and that's how much force this thing measures so it's incredibly tiny. And that's what makes the thing hard to do. You can get it to react, but to get it to react in a way that's uh, where you can make accurate measurements is uh, is quite a difficult task. Yeah, there's, there's a difference between getting a definite, it's moving because of the introduction of the larger mass and getting an accurate and precise measurement of the actual force, right? There's a very 
very distinct difference between those. And of course, whether or not gravity exists is answered by the easier one, right? The if if the masses move, th then mass attracts mass. Um, then the next question is whether or not you can m measure the, the the magnitude of gravity. Right. I'd say that would right. show whether or not a force exists. Exactly whether or not that force is gravity, that's a whole other question. Well, it's but, a good point. It's a good point. Yeah, yeah that's a fair point. So, and, and yes, you got to uh, uh, you have to be careful because there can be other uh, other forces at play, and we know that, right? Uh, there could be magnetic forces involved, for instance. Especially if you're so using metal. So. How do you? Yeah, you can also have electrostatic forces. Those things, those sorts of things, could could be affecting it. So you got to be really sure that you have done things that uh, uh, control or eliminate the possibility of some magnetic influence or some electrostatic influence. Those are two primary things. And then, of course, there are physical things that could affect it, like uh, air currents. If you know, you, you can imagine how sensitive this thing is. You're talking about a piece of wire that is smaller than the smallest uh, diameter guitar, guitar string that you can purchase. It's a tiny little wire, right? So it doesn't take very much to make this thing move. And a, a little bit of air current is more, is, uh, definitely going to cause movement so all of these things have to be uh have to be taken into into account considered and eliminated or at least controlled so and that's one thing cavendish was excellent at doing he knew exactly what to look for and what he should be uh, uh concerned about and he took steps in every case to to make sure that he wasn't being fooled by, uh, by believing th that the force was a, uh, the gravitational attraction when in fact it was something else. And that's the reason why Cavendish, uh, to this day, uh, is in my mind, at least, uh, the prototype, uh, for scientific experimentation. He was so thorough and so methodical in everything he did when it came to this thing. Let's have a look at the actual device too. So here is a scale model. Yeah. And then here's yours. Look at that. <laughs> I love how you, bit. I love how you modeled yours after his. Yeah, that was part of the, uh, well, that was part of the whole idea. This experiment gets done in, in physics classrooms uh, in universities all over the world, uh, hundreds if not thousands of times every year, right? But typically, normally, it's just done with a, a tabletop uh, device that works on the same principle but doesn't look anything like this, right? Not at all. Uh, and I really wanted to replicate uh, as much as I could could the physical design that Cavendish used uh, to the greatest extent I could I, I could do that now Cavendish uh, had some uh, advantages that I don't have and on the other hand I had some he didn't have um, Cavendish was a wealthy guy I'm not Cavendish could afford to build a building like you see uh, in, in that uh, scale model up there uh, a separate building that he uh, could house his experiment in and um, he was not limited by uh, by the size of the uh, of the building because he was going to build it you know, to suit the experiment he, uh, John Michel had originally wanted to use eight inch diameter lead balls and those things would have weighed about a hundred pounds each I think hmm. maybe a little more Cavendish didn't like that idea. He wanted he wanted really big lead balls. He went for the twelve inch things, and those twelve inch lead balls that Cavendish used were three hundred and fifty pounds a piece. Well, 
for me, that's out of the question. I have no way to handle a 350 pound lead ball to begin with. Um, and secondly, his uh, Cavendish made his his uh, his torsion balance six feet long, and that, that makes the height of it uh, such that if I had made it exactly to scale or to to the same scale he he built his to, I didn't have enough room and the, enough head height inside my uh, workshop area, so I cut it down to two thirds. Uh, my torsion balance is four feet long, as opposed to his six foot one. My lead balls are six inch diameter instead of 12. So mine only weigh 50 pounds a piece. Um, so you say, well, is that, does all the scaling, is that going to mess up anything? And that, that was one of the first concerns I had. Um, have I, am I going to compromise the experiment by, by changing things that much? Right. Um, so one of the first things I did was sit down and go through all of the, uh, all the calculations to figure out if I, I could expect to get or, or figure out a way to get a torsion wire that would give me approximately the same amount of deflection and about the same oscillation period that, that Cavendish uh, was able to achieve with his device. And it turned out that it, it, it became obvious after doing the calculations that yeah, you can. Uh, uh, Cavendish used a brilliant, well, not brilliant. Cavendish used a just a, a, a copper wire, probably some alloy uh, stuff they used to call white copper. I think it had nickel in it and some silver. Uh, uh, I found out that I could use different material like uh, carbon steel, for instance, or tungsten or beryllium copper. And I could get the wire sized small enough that it would do essentially exactly what Cavendish did. So while my deflections aren't quite as much as he had, they're close enough. And the oscillation periods are almost exactly what he had. So I was happy enough with that. Uh, could I uh, just show uh, for uh, reference, because you mentioned the that uh, people use like tabletop versions. Yeah. Uh, so here is just as an example, here is a tabletop version that you can purchase. Right. You can see there's, um, there's zoom in quite a bit. There's a glass, um, uh, glass front and back. And then there's the, the masses that you can add on either side. And then inside has the torsion wire and the, um, the internal masses. Um, and then this one, this one looks like you can maybe pull a vacuum in it. Not sure. So, yeah, I think you can. Yeah. So just as a, as a reference, those you can, you can get for about a thousand dollars for these pretty decent ones. So, yeah. So, yeah. all right. Exactly the same principle. Yeah. Uh, they're just very small. And for the most part, they're, they're reasonably accurate given the size that they are. Most of them will, will, will make the, uh, the measurement of the gravitational constant to a, a tolerance of about, well, they'll get within 20% anyway. And some of the better ones can get within 5%. So that's not too bad. But the question I really wanted to answer for myself was, uh, um, number one, can you actually build this crazy thing? Um, and it turns out it's not as hard as it, as it seemed. Uh, but number two, okay, if you built it, can you actually expect to get um, the kind of accuracy that, that Cavendish got? Uh, so I got to tell you that when Cavendish ran this thing, he ran a total of, I think, 27 or 28 uh, test runs. And at the end of the day, he came out came up with a uh, density for the earth that is within about one percent of the value that we use to this day so when it, you say that he's trying to weigh the entire accurate. earth with this i'm sorry well he got the density of the earth okay he figured out the specific gravity average specific gravity of the earth 
And that's how he stated it. See, uh, let's go back, uh, go back a bit. Sure. When, yeah. when Sir Isaac Newton uh, came up with his famous gravitational equation, uh, relationship, I guess I should say, uh, uh, it simply said that the force of attraction between two masses was proportional to the product of those masses divided by the square of the distance between their centers, not equal to, proportional to. And nobody knew what that constant of proportionality is. Obviously, if you say something is proportional to something else, that implies that you there is some number you can multiply one thing by to make it equal to the other thing, right? Okay. Nobody knew what G was. Nobody knew what that, that constant of proportionality was. And at the time Cavendish did his experiment, it was not even recognized that that uh, in the in the formulation of the of the law of gravitation that that constant should be in there. That didn't really take place until a guy named C.V. Boyce came along about 100 years after Cavendish. He was the first guy that said, okay, enough of this. It, the formula really ought to say instead of F is proportional to, it ought to say F is equal to big G times the product of the masses divided by the square of the distance between their centers. Okay. So when Cavendish did his work, he was primarily looking for the density of the earth. He wanted to find out how dense the earth was compared to water. And uh, that's a pretty handy thing to know, right? Because in, in fact, when you think about this, if you know what the density of the earth is, and you know what the size of the earth is, and remarkably, even in Cavendish's paper, he gives a diameter of the earth that is less than 1% different from the diameter we use today as an average diameter. So he knew those things. Therefore, he would have known the, the total mass of the earth. And you only need to know one other thing. If you know what the acceleration of gravity is, and Galileo came up with that, I think. Uh, uh, Tune, you probably remember that better than I do. I think Galileo Leo was the, uh, the first guy to actually measure little g or at least uh, that's the way I remember the story. Maybe oh. not, but yeah, I'm not. Little I'm not G certain. was well yeah. known. Little G was well known. So if you know little G, and you know the mass of the uh, of the Earth, and you know, uh, then you know everything you need to know to come up with the, the gravitational constant. So a lot of people will argue that Cavendish actually did measure the universal gravitational constant. He just didn't state it. And I kind of like that opinion myself. I think that's exactly what he did. Okay, so he's measuring the amount of acceleration between the masses. Uh, so I'm guessing he's using different masses to see if one mass causes a greater amount of acceleration than another mass. And then he's kind of measuring the difference between the two. Is that right? You can. Um, the, the, the small mass doesn't matter. It's only the large mass. Well, yeah, he's the 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 small mass would be the um, the dependent variable, and it's dependent upon the the larger mass, which is the independent variable. So, um, is that right? The it, the the small mass is the one mass that's staying the same, and then the the larger mass is the one that you switch out for different amounts, and that way you can see if it causes an effect. Uh, a different effect upon the smaller mass. Is that right? Yeah, you can. Uh, yeah, yeah, you certainly could uh, switch them out. But there's other things you could do. That's the the. I thought that was the whole point of it. Is you wanted to to get, I guess, a graph to see. Okay, this is our target, and we want to go. We want to try and get that target, and so in order to get that target, we need to pick a bunch of small masses. Okay, so if I increase this mass, it's gonna cause this much acceleration. So now I'm gonna increase it. And as I keep doing this whole changing the mass and getting a different amount of acceleration, then I can make a prediction saying, okay, so according to these results, if I were to have a much larger mass and I could even state the mass, then according to these results, I can get this much acceleration. Is that the purpose of the experiment or am I off on that? 
Uh, yeah, there's there's other okay. ways than just swapping out different masses to okay. to get the quantity uh, or the magnitude of of the uh, um the the force, right? Uh, if you know to a super high degree of precision the ten the torsion constant of the the wire, which blue I'm guessing you didn't know. Um, and the torsion is the amount of tightness. Am I right? It's, twist, uh, how, twist. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, it's it's Truth. when you twist a certain amount, you know, there's a certain amount of force needed. There, some of the the torsion bar experiments have uh, extremely high accuracy in the torsion wire. And that's how one of the typically these like not this one, but like the ones that are in the, the, the big journals, they do two ways in one experiment. They'll do two different measurements with different methods. And one of them is often with the um, the strength of the or the the, the torsion constant. I, I, OK, so is this the vertical wire that we see the big gray vertical wire that? we Yeah, see yeah. The, but that the, the, with this model? particular experiment. That's not what he did. It's the okay. the the timing, right? Blue. Yeah. Right. Right. Exactly. So, can you explain <clears throat> how the the timing gives you that 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 quantity? One thing that might uh, well, I'll tell you. You've got that. You've got the paper, right? Yes. Why don't we go through something real quick? Okay. Uh, let me let me tell you what page to go to. Okay. Just hang on. The the big paper, the one that you yeah. you wrote up. Yeah. So. I'll get here's the cover page. But Kyle, you're on the right yeah, track. There, there's different ways to to measure the magnitude of the strength. The magnitude of the force. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm still kind of trying okay. to gather in because. Different people have done the experiment in different ways, and so I'm kind of trying to figure out yeah. what way this is being done. Yep. All right, Blue. All right, so go down to uh, run down to page 23. Okay. Uh, it's not 23. That's not 23. Oh, Look oh. at page number 23. Yep. All right. Uh, there is 25, 23. There it is. Okay, yeah. Same little diagram we've been looking at, right? Yes. And now we've got labels. Now we now we pay attention to the, the labels that are on there. Uh, the, the little masses are, are little m's. The big masses are big m's. The distance from the point of rotation to the center of the little mass, this is the, the, the torsion beam itself, is little d. The separation... Or, or the uh, uh, deflection is little r, the, the, the amount that the... Uh, uh, the displacement? In fact, I think I, I'm thinking that I, I think that diagram is wrong. It should be that little r, that, that, uh, that dimension line should not be to the red oh, yeah. ball. It should be to the blue ball. Okay. The I made a mistake ball. on that. Got to fix that. Okay. Just notice that. Um, so that's what that would be. And then, and then we're defining the forces, as you can see, in the direction, directly in, in line with, the, uh, with the, the center line of the large masses. All right. So in your large model, uh, was the large silver ball the big M ball that you see here? Or are they the, they're the, the, like the blue ones here, right? Yeah, you, you've got the big M blue balls. Uh, yeah, was the that the M's. silver ball yeah. that we just barely looked at? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I didn't see the yeah, other little really balls big. in there, the, the little M's. I didn't see those ones in the model. Yeah, we'll show them. We'll show them okay. to you in a minute. Okay. Uh, we'll show them to you in a minute. Here's how here's how this thing goes. The the torque on the wire, uh, or the, the the torque that we're we're applying to the wire, which I call tau is two times F times D. Think about this. F is the force of one of these little balls being pulled toward one of the big balls. But we got two little balls and two big balls. So two Fs, right, times the distance. That's torque. 
tau is two times F times D. All right. But we also know that F is Newton's gravitational law, which is G times big M times little m divided by R squared times. So that gives you that second expression there. Tau is equal to two G big M little m divided by R squared times D. All right. That's good. Now. I'm, I'm kind of putting together a, a force equals mass times acceleration thing here. I've seen the F, I'm seeing the M, and yeah. uh, we've got an, an A, which we're, not, we're trying to figure out here. Yeah, Is that right? We're not looking for acceleration. We're not looking for acceleration at all right now. Oh, okay. We're looking for torque. And torque is a force applied at a distance from a point of rotation. That's torque. You know what a torque wrench is, right? You know how, uh, uh, how torque wrenches work? Uh, if you take, a, if you take a, a, a bar that's one foot long and with a socket on the end of it on a, on a nut, and you put 10 pounds of force at the end of that one foot long wrench, you have 10 foot pounds of torque, right? That's torque. Uh -huh. Well, that's all we're figuring out here is what is the torque? The torque is, is, is that expression that we're showing there. Okay. But so that we're talking about the amount of force that's at the center of rotation. So yeah, at the very yeah, center. That's, that's the force that's, that's, uh, that's acting on the end of that, uh, of that torsion balance. At the that's end or the at the center that's, that's, of the, the axis that, no, point. That, no, the force is acting out there at the, at the ends, at the little balls. Okay. Uh -huh. Well, you're talking about a torque so, wrench, and that torque wrench happens at the axis. You, you, you push on one side, yeah, 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 and right. then you get that amount of yeah, torque. The is, yeah, the, 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 yeah, the resulting torque is, is there at the, at the wire, sure. But the force itself is out at the end. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. So how do you measure that but, force at the end uh, when there's nothing touching the ball? Okay. I'm going to show you here in a second. Okay. All right. So, so that expression told us, uh, told us what the torque in the wire is. Um, and, and what we'd have to keep in mind though is, that moves the, the little ball from one resting from the, the, from the position it's in right now to the red position. But we want the, the amount of torque that's going to be required to move it from the, the, the red position that you see up there to the, the opposite red position. Okay. So that's two times as much movement. That takes two times as much torque. So that gives us that Second trying expression. To, trying to understand what you mean by page. opposite position there. I'm sorry. Okay. You're, you're trying uh, to get it to go 180 degrees. Is that right? No, no, no. You see the red line and the, the, the two red balls, right? Yeah. All I'm talking about is move the, 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 the red ball on the left that's above the blue ball, move it down below the blue ball, the same uh -huh. amount that it's above the blue ball. Oh, okay. That's all it's going to do. It's just going to going to move from the, the position it's in to sort of the opposite position all right as it swings okay okay so uh that's what we'll call delta t or delta delta tau um now let's go let's see you need to go down but you need to go down to the bottom of the page i'm talking i'm not watching yours oh I'm there's tau this. yep there yeah, yeah. There we go. So there's tau is equal to two FD. And so tau is equal to two G big M little M divided by R squared times D that falls, right? I've just replaced force with Newton's uh, expression. And F, F equals MA, is, right? Yeah. Yep. yep. But now we, now we need the torque to go from one side to the other side. So that's 2T, and that's 4MG, big M, little m, divided by R squared D. We call that delta T, or delta uh, tau. So now let's go to the next page. There you go.
But in torsional motion, tau is also uh, minus k, where k is the torsion constant, times theta, or the, the angle through which this thing rotates. So we can say delta tau is equal to minus k times delta theta. Now, what that <clears throat> that's equation two that I'm talking about. Uh, the minus sign, don't pay much attention to that. That is simply giving us direction. The minus sign says that the restoring force, in other words, the, the wire trying to, to resist the uh, or pull the torsion balance back into, into its resting position, is acting in the opposite direction of the, of the rotation. So the minus sign just tells us direction. It doesn't really mean anything. We're, we're going to get rid of it in a second. But a torsion balance, again, is simply a, a horizontal pendulum. Now, a regular gravity pendulum has a period that we can, and, and you can do this yourself uh, very easily. You can figure out the, the, the time, the period of oscillation of a pendulum is equal to 2 pi times the square root of the length of the pendulum divided by a little g, right? So if you've got a pendulum that's one meter long, the period of oscillation would be 2 pi times the square root of one meter divided by 9.8, whatever that comes out to. Um, it's easy enough to, to, to figure that out. When it comes to a horizontal pendulum, we don't have gravity anymore. We've got, we've got this torque that's the restoring force that acts in, in the place of gravity. So the period of this horizontal pendulum, T, is equal to 2 pi times the square root of I over K. I is the moment of inertia of that torsion balance. And the moment of inertia is, is simply uh, uh, unit mass times the square of the distance uh, from its point of rotation. But we've got two of those masses, right? So the moment of inertia of the torsion balance in a simplified form is two times the mass of one of those small weights times the square of its distance from the, from the uh, center of rotation, the point of rotation. So that's what we're calling a uh, moment of inertia. Now, if we combine uh, equation one and two, if you remember the one before it, four G times big M, little m divided by R squared. Um, and we uh, stick that, uh, let's see, combine one and two, yeah. So we've got minus K delta theta is equal to delta tau, and delta tau was uh, four uh, G big M little m divided by R squared D, so therefore K this is where I've just dropped the minus sign. This torsion constant is four times G times big M times little M divided by D or times D divided by R squared delta theta. Great. Now we got another equation and we're almost done. If we combine equations three, four, and five, go down a little bit. There, Oop, I'll back up just slightly. So we can see three, four, and five. There you go. Now take off, take three, four, and five, and uh, <coughs> and combine them, and you'll find out that t is equal to two pi times the square root of uh, that thing we said was i, two m d squared, right? That's i times, yeah, divided by k, and we, what we got to do now is invert and multiply, right? So R squared delta theta divided by 4G, big M, little m, D. And that reduces to the universal gravitational constant being equal to 2 pi squared R squared D delta theta divided by big M, T squared. So what's D delta that's theta? That's all there is to it. Huh? D delta theta, that's the change in the angle? Yeah. There it is. So it, that's a, that's a it's a good amount of algebra. Right? That's all it is. Yeah. Kyle, uh, you homeschool? 
Uh, I, I used to, but not really right now. Okay. Uh, well, I do, and I'm the math teacher, so I got to go over all this with my kids. Yeah. So. <laughs> all right. So you see that uh, at the end of the day, um, what we really need, we only need really need a couple of things. We need to know the value of M, big M, right? It's the mass of know, the the. The, two. the mass of the large, uh, the large ball. Yep. We need to know what it is. We need to know what the period of oscillation is. T is the period of oscillation, so we can measure that, right? We can uh, we can simply time the the oscillation period, and uh, and that gives us that. And the only other thing we need to know is. Uh, that deflection, d delta theta, how much the balance moved in that in that oscillation. So, so do you did you yeah. time one oscillation or did you time like a whole bunch and average them? No, what I would do is time uh, time a, a bunch of them. Uh, you don't want to try to just time one. Uh, yeah, you, you need you, your. You can get very, very inaccurate answers that way. What yeah. you do is time. I would always time five or six oscillations at least. And how long Sometimes. did an so, oscillation an take? Oscillation. It, what are you meaning by oscillation it, itself? Are you, is, is it like a one eighty degree spin or? Uh, no, it's uh, uh, when I when I talk about an oscillation, I'm talking about. Uh, well, let's talk about a, a, a grandfather clock because it's easy to visualize, right? An oscillation in it is from the point where the the, uh, the bob on the end of the of the of the pendulum reaches its maximum uh, swing on one side. Okay, if you start at that point and measure the period of time it takes for it to swing all the way to the other side and then come all the way back. Okay, so it's that's one oscillation. All the, that's one oscillation right. going from yep. one side exactly. to the other. Nine o'clock to three. Right. Okay. Yeah, and and with the torsion balance, it's the same thing. It's the amount of time it takes it to swing to here and come back. So that's it's, one period there and back. Oh, that's, uh, I was I can't say I was expecting that. I was expecting it to just kind of go slowly to the the large ball and then just stay there. No, it won't do that. Uh, it went farther. It won't do that because, yeah, it, it overshoots. Uh, it has uh, it, the thing has inertia, right? Uh huh. Yeah. So when you first move when you first move the large balls into position, uh, it they begin to attract they they are now attracting the small balls and they are accelerating that torsion balance. They're causing the, the balance to begin to, to move and it accelerates as it moves. That's a lot and more, actually, that's a lot more speed than I was expecting. <laughs> it goes, it goes further than it should just because of the inertia. Uh -huh. So it goes until the wire says, okay, that's it. You've wound me up too tight. Now you got to swing back the other way and then it overshoots the opposite direction so the uh -huh. thing is it forms a a damped oscillation in fact hang on a second uh soon i'll get you to show whoops what did i just do hopefully i didn't shut my entire computer down no i didn't uh there is if you go to page go back up to page 18 so this is where the wire tension itself is actually uh has an effect on it that yeah. you're acknowledging here. Yeah. I'll show you a picture of oh, what it looks go. like. Got it. There, there. you are. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Those are the oscillations. That's the oscillation of the beam. And you, you there's and a, you'll see. there's a mirror on the wire and you shine a laser at the, Right, the, the exactly. Lights, it's, and then you measure it like on the wall, right? Yeah, yeah. We can go back and look at some of the uh, some of the uh, pictures, 
and you can see that, but that's how the oscillations look. And it's a damp, it's what we call a damped oscillation. You can see it's becoming less and less as time goes on. So if you leave it going long enough, it will eventually stop oscillating. But you can see from the formula, we actually need the oscillation. We need it to oscillate uh, because we need that time measurement. Now, we, didn't, we wouldn't necessarily have to have it every time. Uh, it, it really doesn't change. The period, oscillation period is you know, it's just like a grandfather clock. It, it's, uh, it's pretty repeatable. Uh, but at least for, uh, for the purpose of determining what T is, we've got to be able to measure that once, at least once, right? And I prefer to measure it on every test. There can be slight differences. So that's that's what we when we talk about oscillations. That, that's what we're talking about. And you notice okay. how that how the graph changes. You see on the left hand side it's up high, and there toward the center it drops down, right? And that if you can sort of average out those oscillations on the left hand side, and then average out the oscillations on the right hand side, the difference in those two values is D delta theta that we were talking about. That's the okay. difference in the resting position. So, so that's how it's measured. Since the two are connected, are you taking a combined force here or are you just trying to do one, just measuring the force of one separate individual? Not sure I understood. Okay, so we've got a we've got a bar, and then we've got a yep. ball on this side and a ball on this side, and then right. there's a force that moves the balls. But uh, because both balls are at an equal distance from the attracting ball, as it, uh, we'll call it that, okay, that means there's a, the it's a combined force that's causing them both to move. You can't just move one without moving the other, right? Right. Yeah. And so it, it's yeah, not just both, the force of one ball that you're attracting. It's actually both of them. It's both of them. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so it's a combined. Yeah, it's so it's it's the mass of both balls and the mass. Yeah. So it's the mass of both attracting right. balls versus uh, right. the ones that are getting attracted. And so, okay. So do you yeah. have, so somebody suggested um, maybe if you have video of, of this oscillation somewhere. I do. On one of your videos. You want to maybe pull that up? Um, Let me. Yeah. While you're looking for that, I will uh, let's see here. I, uh, a super chat came in. I thought I would read that here quick. That would be good. And uh, oh, I don't know if it rolled Always off. Always read super chats. Oh, no. Oh, no. It might have rolled off. Let me look. Um, I didn't. Yeah, I didn't have the right page up, so it didn't. Oh, there it is. Okay, Joshua Elek said for four ninety nine. How do we know that the small weights aren't moving because of the Earth's rotation, like Foucault's pendulum? It's a good question. I think I can answer that. Um, a Foucault's pendulum has movement in it already these do already but but it's it's a uh, yeah it, it's a, it's a free moving in a different in a different manner than this one is um maybe maybe uh maybe blue can can expand on that a little bit the difference between Foucault's pendulum mm. and this one? I, I think that's yeah. a really good question. Yeah, well, at, at the Foucault's pendulum is, is there's a single pivot point at the top, and it's it's free to rotate in any in any direction that you want, but it's, it's in initially going in one plane back and forth, and then the rotation of the Earth, that, that pendulum stays somewhat rigid within within three-dimensional space and then the earth rotates so the pendulum appears to be rotating from our reference frame this particular one 
where you have a bar that's going like this instead of a pendulum going like this. It's a different movement in a different plane. That's why, right? This is a vertical plane. This is a horizontal plane. There you go. Let me see. We've got Brandon. Oh. Brandon, is it fall? I don't know. Is that a F A I or F A L L? Um, and I know he's the one that took over uh, Ranty's channel. It's fall. Okay. Um. So hilarious. Did these balls suck together? Maybe. Maybe not. Where was the moon? You always call people out and you yourself are stupid. Well, um, the moon, <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, go ahead, provide the plausible mechanism for what other things might be causing them to move together. So here's the deal, Brandon. Um, you can just let it sit there without introducing those masses and they do one thing. You introduce those masses, you make one change one change and the apparatus responds differently it goes that it shifts in in its twist right then you remove those masses and it goes back to its original starting place thus completely satisfying the super narrow sleeping warrior uh a version of science which is way too 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 narrow but that you change one variable, you introduce the masses and you remove the masses and you introduce the masses and you remove the masses and one thing changes. So where the moon Why is, is there, what force is causing it to move backward? Are, are we still talking about this whole, uh, this whole Cavendish experiment? Or are you talking yeah, about something well, different? This is, this is okay. the same one. He's so trying to if, cast, oh, he's trying to question it because of where the moon was, for example. Um, <clears throat> Because he, he, you know, he's he he thinks. So I, I don't know if you know who Brandon Fall is, but he he thinks that just ask, just saying, well, maybe it's this somehow is a valid refutation. It is not saying maybe it's this. If you think Brandon or anybody, it's not a refutation. It's a it's a it's a it's a good question. It's a hypothesis. It, it, it is right. Yeah. So so the question is not an argument. So maybe the, is kind of it could be a question right there. Yeah. So so is so it this? To, to to be clear then. If you have an idea for what might be going on, then test it, right? Find the plausible mechanism and see if that plausible mechanism does have that type of an impact. Okay. So, so if the moon you're was in one... About, okay. Yeah, you're go talking ahead. about we have the two attracting balls and then uh, those attracting balls are causing some movement and then you take the balls away and all of a sudden they move back to their original they positions? Go back to the original, yes. Yeah. What is what force is causing them to go back to the original position? That right there. That's the torque. It's the, the torque in the wire. Yeah. Uh, so the torque in the wire causes it to go the back. The torque in the wire. Ah, oh, right. okay. Right. The torque in the wire is uh, is what we call a re that's uh, the restoring force, and it acts just like just like uh, like regular gravity does on a regular pendulum which is basically like a plumb bob, you know, when you think about oh, okay. it, a plumb bob is a pendulum, right? If you leave it alone oh. long enough, it will pull itself down to its lowest gravitational potential. It'll pull itself straight down. Well, this thing will do the same thing with, uh, except it's with the restoring force of the, of the torque that's in the wire. As long as the wire has got torque in it, it's going to be pulling that, that balance back, uh, to try to get rid of the torque. That's what it's trying to do. It's trying to oh. reach its lowest energy state. So as long as oh, we've okay. got energy stored in it in, in the form of torque, it's going to react by pushing the opposite direction. Okay. Yeah. That's one of my, my major questions I had coming on here is, okay, what is the, um, the control to the experiment? And that's where we're seeing what happens when you take it away. You, you, you introduce the the two attracting balls and then you take them away and that's kind of where you get the right. control in the experiment right right so you want to see the oscillations yes yeah let's see them. we wanted to look at uh do you let's want to share your screen or do you want to send me the okay i is the the uh the file is just too big i'll have to i'll have to share my screen if that's okay yeah 
Okay. It's like even, uh, it's like a 40 megabyte file. Uh, so you guys can see that okay? Yep. All right. We're going to have to reposition a little bit. Let me know when it, you're ready. I have it, uh, yeah, I have it way too big on my screen here. So, all right, give it a go. All right, let's watch it run. So you, now you see the oscillations are back in here. And the midpoint so, is somewhere oh, like about right. there. But now, now you see that's where I moved the big balls. And now the center of oscillation is moved up here somewhere. Let's do it again. Oops, wait a minute. So that's with the big balls in one position. And it looks like it's averaging maybe 175 or something. And now I moved them to the, uh, to the uh, alternate position. And you see the oscillation moves up upscale. It's like at and 21 that's that or 22, that, that yeah. Delta, so, yeah. That's that so instead of watching the... Theta we were looking for. So instead of watching the ball moving, we're just watching the laser moving back and forth? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. And you uh, you recorded this and then just went over the recording to get the the timing and the measurement of distance? Yeah, right. Yeah. You can take a you can take a video tracking software like uh, like Tracker and take this uh, time lapse video and run it through Tracker and that's where that graph came from. That is not me selecting data, that is Tracker pulling the position of this laser dot uh, off each frame and plotting it. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's quite, it's quite neat the software that you got available these days. But maybe we ought to look at a few more of those pictures and, and, and help you see. Sure. Uh, now that you've seen the laser move, let's see. So it got us back in one piece again. Yep. Yeah. And so you want, uh, yeah, pull, want pull go back to your, so. yeah. Um, from your paper, your big paper. Yeah. Uh, no, the, uh, what do we call that? The first, the overview. Yeah. I think there's all kinds of pictures down in there. Yeah. All right. Oh yeah, sure. So, and I'll have to share it so everybody sees it. There you go. You got that? Yeah, there you go. Yeah. So that's the outer frame that we're looking at. That's the framework that's, uh, that holds up the large, the large balls. Go down to that. So here's the bar. That's the okay, that's the bar, right? That the big balls hang from. There's a hole in either end of it, and the brass rod uh, that the uh, that the large balls uh, go uh, hang from go through those hole, those end holes, and that center uh, pulley thingy uh, sits on a shaft so that it's. Uh, it rotates and it's really easy to rotate it's, it's on a bearing so mm. quite easy to rotate and uh next i think you got a picture just of the big lead balls for anybody that cares well those things the... are six inches in diameter they weigh about 50 pounds uh, 50 pounds isn't a lot of weight but it, it will surprise you when you try to pick one up because they are so small only six inches in diameter and they weigh 50 pounds. It's hard to trick, hard to get your fingers under them. Wow. Uh, yeah. A little shocking. The next picture is a picture of the actual cabinet. That's the, that's the enclosure. Probably not the best uh, photograph I've got, but uh, you see that window in the front of it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that little window right there is the the uh, is that is the window that the laser shines through, and it shines on a mirror that's on the uh, mounted on the torsion bar. 
So that's the purpose of that. And then you see the little, there's the little weights. What's their the diameter? Weights that go inside. They are um, two inches. Okay. Two inches. There's the torsion balance. Now, at that point, in, uh, with this picture, the, the mirror is not mounted on it, on the torsion balance yet. Uh, so you can't really see it, but you see the, you see how that, uh, that wood beam, that torsion, that balance beam is in there. And those lead, those small lead weights we just looked at, there's one hanging on each end of it, right? And you can't see the wire. The wire is just far too, too tiny. This I makes it look like they can't spin a full 360 around. No, they can't. No, okay. they can't. They can only move about an inch. Oh, okay. <clears throat> they can move about, well, either direction. They can move about an inch either direction. So total movement of about two inches is all they've got room for. Uh-huh. And let's see. What comes after that? So if I could say um, somebody had noticed that the, um, the the smaller masses had, they're not perfectly balanced. They have, they have um, numbers embedded in them, right? And, and um, P, PJC Net has identified that. He's a, he's a flat earther here. And, and it's, it's a good, it's a good point. What it's going to introduce a small margin of error, right? Well, Actually, what you saw were, uh, I didn't have any choice except to purchase uh, a quantity of these things. Two of I couldn't buy just two. I think I ended up with seven of them. These are a couple of the leftovers. Okay. The ones that are actually in there have been polished. Those those 28-ounce marks are not on them. Oh, okay. And they've been, match and they've been matched up uh, uh, mass-wise. Okay. But now if, if they were still like that, if you didn't do that, what would that do to the experiment? What would be the result of that? You know, I don't uh, think precision. I don't believe that, that the uh, measurement accuracy of this thing would be good enough to be able to detect that, uh, that yeah. little bit of, but of if, uh, if it were anomaly, if it were, it would, at, at most, it would introduce a margin of error, but it, yeah, would, it would. would not make the difference between testing if gravity exists and testing if gravity does not exist. And oh, that's no. and that's no, what and that's what PJC Net is is a, uh, you know, he's trying to cast aspersions on it, but that's not the aspersions to cast, right? He it's a fantastic critique for for getting you know more significant digits to the final result but uh all that all that i care about at a high level is does this confirm that mass attracts mass and that's all that it does and so that type of that type of um imprecision doesn't change whether or not mass attracts mass well i think oh, uh, oh. A way to further explore that question, because we just established that a force is doing this, and exactly what kind of force we don't, we it, this doesn't really establish that. I would like to see the same experiment done with different kinds of weights. For example, we've got metal. What? How about we try rubber and see if that has the same results? Does that make sense? And that way we can say just how electromagnetic it is, or, or we can test for some other things. And so it's doing the same experiment, but just changing a few factors yeah so did you do anything um blue for uh having everything at the same electrical potential yeah as a matter of fact i did um uh, well first of all uh well i guess yeah we can talk we'll talk about the electrical aspect of it um uh, that was concerning, and there was a point when I was uh, when I first started working with this thing when it became obvious that I probably was looking at some electrostatic uh, influence, and I was pretty sure that was true simply because the torsion balance was wanting to go in the opposite direction. It was wanting to go the wrong way, 
And so you think, well, what is that? What's causing that? Um, there's nothing magnetic in the system. What's left? I mean, there's no air currents. We've got this thing sealed up. What's left? It's electric. It's got to be electrostatics. You've got so, copper wiring. Well, don't you, you don't see it in this picture, huh? You got copper wiring so in what? there, don't you? Yeah. Copper wiring. So that's going to have some kind of effect, electrical wise, anyway. Uh, not really. Not really. The wire is non-magnetic. You just said it was copper, and copper is not magnetic. No, no, not at all. Uh, oh, um, okay. I thought it, it carried an electrical current. Copper was really well known for well, okay. uh, yeah, copper wiring very, for really carrying good. electric. Oh yeah, it's a really good conductor of but electricity. You, yeah, you need uh -huh. you need flowing electrons for that to happen though. If there's no flowing uh -huh. electrons, then you don't have it right. generating a magnetic right. field. Okay. And so but it's pretty uh, it was it's pretty easy to get rid of the electrostatic problem by simply uh, shielding the inside of the cabinet. So that's what I did. Uh, and I can pull up a picture if somebody wants if anybody really wants to see it. Uh, and yeah, show you I was under the understanding like. that just a, a plain wire uh, can generate its own electromagnetic field. Uh, it's got the electrons going through it. There's not just no, because you're not adding anything force to force electrons. Through. Yeah. Well, there's there's the there's force electrons that do it, but uh, it's power. just <clears throat> got stuff holding it together. It's got natural <clears throat> ones to it as well, so it can, can it can take on extra, but it has its own current already going no it doesn't have its own current no okay yeah it, it you, you need to in order to to have like i said you need to have flowing electrons to mm -hmm. to otherwise copper is diamagnetic it's actually slightly re you know um <clears throat> res resistant to not resistant um moves away from a magnetic field but there's uh -huh. but there's nothing here generating a magnetic field I thought everything generated a magnetic field because everything is electromagnetic. No. I okay. don't know well, where I'll you would have to look more into that. Yeah, you probably should. Um. Everything's got electrons moving through it. That's part of the atomic structure for vast majority of things. Yeah, but if they're not if they don't have a mechanism to move, then they don't generate a magnetic field. Okay. Uh, yeah. That's I, right. I'll have to look into that. I was yeah. I mean that that's that's the basis of everything since the late 1800s. Uh mm -hmm. you know, motors, electric uh electric motors, right? It it's a a generates an electric field and it and it switches its polarity so that so that the permanent magnet in the motor is attracted or repelled from the the field that it's generating and it's constantly changing that field. Mm -hmm. But it requires flow if you disconnect the electrical you know this, right? If you unplug the motor, it stops spinning. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, and so there's the, the stronger forces and weak forces. And as I understand it, just there's electricity in the air. That's how we get lightning. And sometimes there's a lot more of it than others. And, and uh, But yeah, and that's, we couldn't get lightning if there was no electricity or electrons yeah. in the air. And that's, that's static electricity. And it's like he was saying, he it, it is something you can you can deal with so mm -hmm. blue was actually talking about so maybe maybe we should let him i'd like to hear how did you how did you uh shield it blue uh if you'll stop sharing for a second i'll i'll share my screen and show you sure. let's see share screen screen two okay hopefully you can see that now that's the can you see it now? Yes. Oh, you coated the inside of it. Yeah, the whole, the entire inside of it is uh, is covered in copper foil. We found out that you can. It's a you you, know, you, you go on uh, Amazon and get this stuff. It's copper foil uh, with a conductive adhesive backing, and it's specifically made for static shielding. They use this inside the uh, the body of like electric guitars and uh, amplifiers and stuff like that. So I got a bunch of that stuff, 
and completely wallpapered the entire inside of that chamber down there where the torsion balance is. And as soon as I did that and connected it, of course, to an earth ground, as yep. soon as I did that, the electrostatic problem disappeared. And I've never had a magnetic issue. So because everything in the system is, is diamagnetic, the, uh, the lead balls are diamagnetic. The, they've got bre- the uh, attachments are brass, uh, the wiring, the uh, support wiring on the torsion balance is actually uh, beryllium copper. So there's nothing magnetic in the system. Okay. And we've tried, and, and I've tried it too. I've got, I've, I've, I've put magnets against it to see if it would do anything. Nothing. Okay. So, so that's how cool. that was handled. Right. Let me get back to, oh, where'd you go, Blue? Turn off your camera. Yeah. Turn it off for a minute. All right. So uh, let me, I got a couple other questions from the uh, the gallery here. Let me go over them. Oh, we got a few. We've got uh, Joshua Ellick said, I think Blue Marble answered my question. The clockwise slash counterclockwise oscillation shows it's not the same force that governs a full cult's pendulum. That's right. Yeah. Uh, we've got Judy Bassett said, thanks, MC Tune, and you're welcome, Judy. Um, she was asking, I think, asking about an equation. I just gave her equation i think uh delco's man has a prediction for you kyle it says that he thinks you will default to put this up on the debate board it's really interesting <laughs> <laughs> kyle has a debate board on is it miro is that right yeah that's right yeah where that's he right. he tracks all of his his uh, stuff and it's open other people can go in there and totally public free put information in so uh and pro then then he says and proceed to in- ignore information so all right, that's the prediction, oh, I, Kyle. It, when it's on the when it's on the debate board, it, yeah, it's pretty difficult to ignore. So. Um, well, I've seen that debate board; it's gigantic. There's a lot in there. So, yeah, every debate I, I go through, it gets thrown on there. So, so uh, Holy Small says, "Do we need to talk about BM Furballs as well?" He does talk quite a bit about his controls in his. So, did Blue? Did you did you do any? Um, referencing to uh the one that bm furball did um actually uh bm furball provided the uh the laser that i'm using this is the oh, laser he, he sent it oh that that's yeah. nice yeah yeah exactly somebody donated it to him so he donated donated it to me and uh i'll be donating it to the university yeah when it when it, this thing goes where it's going All right. uh but BM had a different uh, arrangement altogether. He used a, a stepping motor uh, to control the position of his large masses, right? That's how he turned those things. And um, he did it completely by remote control. I don't do it that way. Uh, I, I, I move these things manually. Uh, actually, a, there's a rope, that, uh, a piece of a paracord wrapped around that pulley at the top and it goes off the, uh, off the side of the enclosure. And I just simply pull on the rope and rotate the thing. That's the way Cavendish did it. So works for Cavendish. I thought it was good enough for him. It's good enough for me. It's pretty cool. So, yeah. so from a, the, the, from a standpoint of, uh, uh, control issues, I didn't have any to, to be concerned about yeah so bm for for reference bm furball did uh, a similar thing in his two-bedroom apartment when he was in korea and his entire apparatus was in a spare bedroom and and blue has has a, a sealed enclosure uh bm furball had it wasn't nearly as well sealed so he actually sealed the room uh, he he shut off. He covered up the the vent to the room. He he shut the door and he put tape around the door, so so that there wouldn't be any airflow in there. And then he used a, a Raspberry Pi, I think, to uh, control it. 
I'll show yeah. you. I'll show you the uh, the mirror too, if you can see that. This is a picture of the. Uh, now you can see the the, the torsion balance, and you can see oh, the yeah. mirror sitting in here. Yeah, right up on top there. There's the laser. It's a little off center, uh, it, the the way it's sitting right there, but uh, that shines on the mirror, shines through that that uh, window that's in the front cover, and comes back out and goes to a target that's behind where I'm standing when I'm making this picture, about ten feet away. Okay. So. That's where the that's what you see the laser spot is on that target, but that's what that thing looks like. Yeah, so having that that laser be farther back lets you have a more precise measurement. Yeah, right, exactly. What it does, what I've done, <clears throat> the distance from the uh, well, heck, let me uh, let me go back and share it again. The distance from the center of the uh, of the torsion balance here to the center line of, of one of the lead balls is two feet, 24 inches. The distance from this mirror back to the target is 10 feet, three inches. Uh, keep in mind that when the, when the laser bounces off the mirror, it, it leaves the mirror at the same angle that it entered the mirror, right? So you double the amount of, of, uh, of movement of that mirror just by virtue of that simple fact alone. So at the bottom, the bottom line to it is if this thing moves, uh, one millimeter, the laser moves 10.3 millimeters. Hmm. Yeah, it's a good multiplying factor. Yeah, that's that and is... it makes it a lot easier, a lot easier to read it. Now Cavendish didn't do it that way. Uh, he used a telescope. Yeah, let me see if I can show you something else. Um, I know I can. Cavendish used. Hang on a second. Can you see that? Yeah. Oh yeah. That's look that's looking in through the end of the of the enclosure. Okay. This is the actually the right hand end, I think, of the uh of the enclosure, and there's a window in that. Is this see? is this Cavendish's actual apparatus? Nope. This is my recreation of Cavendish's apparatus. Oh yours, apparatus. okay. Okay. This is what Cavendish had. He had a scale, a fixed scale that's here on the bottom. And this upper scale is actually screwed on to the end of the torsion balance. So you physically see the, the movement right here. Okay. And, and these, and the lines are, that's a 20th of an inch from zero to that first line, just like Cavendish had it, 1 20th of an inch. That's pretty obnoxious. I don't know why he did that, but that's what he did. <laughs> <laughs> and I actually did one complete test reading, taking all the readings using this vernier scale and reading this thing manually. And trust me, that is a royal pain in the in the butt. <laughs> I wouldn't I can't believe Kevin just did 27 or 28 of those tests doing it that way. That is really, really hard on you. But yeah. So there is a way to physically see the, the balance move if you really want to see it. You can't see the ball move because it's way down below there. But you, how could that – this can't move. I mean, the ball – if this moves, the ball has to move, right? Yeah, yeah. You know that happens. So anyway. That's pretty cool. So I'm kind of looking for the major claim here. Major claim? Yeah, the major claim. So uh, the, someone talked about, put this on the debate board. I'm like, I don't see a claim to put on the debate board. What's the major claim? <laughs> Mass attracts mass. Well, real, realistically, okay. uh, realistically, there was never a claim made. Cavendish okay. didn't claim anything. Uh -huh. This was not a, uh, 
the, the Cavendish was not out to prove uh, that gravity was a thing. He knew it was. Everybody already oh. knew that. That's that's uh, accepted science. Cavendish was out to make a measurement. Okay. Okay. Now we can turn this around and restate it as a uh, a demonstration or a proof, if you will, of, of gravity. You okay. certainly can. And you can come up with uh, uh, independent and dependent variables. Well, uh, I, I think about and, and objectives. What was like go, the major objective? Hmm? I, I'm kind of thinking about objectives. Normally, you have a purpose in mind when you want to start an experiment. And so I'm kind of right. looking for... So the major purpose here, if you already believed in gravity, what was the major purpose of this experiment? The major purpose for, for Cavendish was to determine what the density of the earth was. Okay. The, the major purpose of it today is to determine what the gravitational constant is, uh -huh. which is basically the same thing. I mean, okay. You, so you could, you could argue that you're doing the same thing. But. All right. So he's using this basically as a scale to measure the density of the entire earth. Right. Okay. All right. Uh, that's right. what it boils so, down to. Okay. So that's what it boils down to. All right. So uh, I've heard before that uh, gravity is different depending on your uh, latitude and longitude uh, or just really your distance away from the north and the, from the North Pole. The, the uh, magnitude of the downward uh, um, ex, uh, like acceleration. Your, your yeah. weight is going to be different on the equator than it is on the at the North Pole. At least that's the claim I've heard. Uh, yeah. So would, th would yeah. that mean that that effect would have anything to do with this experiment? W would you have to take your uh, latitude into consideration at all here? I see. Well, since since the torsion bar is suspended by a wire, it's, uh -huh. it's, it's in an orthogonal plane to the downward direction. So the magnitude of the downward direction doesn't matter because it's all orthogonal oh. to it. Okay. Okay. So yeah, but that's the beauty so, of this particular style in, in that torsion bar is, is that it isolates it out. Okay. So we're measuring the density of the entire earth without even touching any of the earth's forces that are, that are attracting. Uh, yeah. Measuring the, the density of the earth, by ignoring the earth. <laughs> well, no, no, it's, it's, it's one step of, of multiple steps to get the density of the earth. Right. Okay. Right. Because, uh, because, uh, the, the, the radius of the earth was known before Cavendish started. Okay. Uh, so. What, the, what the, does the radius have to do with anything? Why, why is that well, important? Be, because in order to get the, the dent, the, the density of the earth, you need to know the volume of the Earth. So if we know the the radius of the sphere, what's the equation for the volume of a sphere? Uh, I don't know, but I'm thinking about. Oh, I, I want I want to oh, know. I'm, blue, I'm, blue has it. Oh, four thirds power r cubed. There you go. Okay, so we're getting the radius of the Earth, and so I'm now I'm starting to see. Uh, are layers of foundation. Okay, so we've got this experiment, which is founded upon someone else's experiment, which determined the radius of the Earth according to you. Is that right? Uh, well, you don't you don't determine the radius of the Earth through an experiment. You do you get the radius of the Earth through a measurement. Okay, but in order right. to find out the measurement, in order to get that measurement, you have to do some kind of experiment. You have to do some kind of observation, and so we could say I could point to. Uh, Eratosthenes, who did an experiment to try and figure out some kind of measurement. Does that make sense? Well, yeah. To, 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 to be pedantic, he, he Eratosthenes wasn't an experiment. It was just a measurement. Okay. But he had yeah. to... I guess you have to find a control in his, and he didn't really do any kind of yeah, control. Yeah, he, he just measured. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Hmm. So right. he took a measurement, and then he he built, he formed a bunch of different conclusions off of that measurement. And so we're looking for that foundation of observation and the experimentation. And he's not really doing an experiment. He's just making some observations and drawing some conclusions from those observations. And measuring. And so, Don't forget the measurement. So that's, yeah. Okay. 
that's what I just said, measurement. He's, he's taking a measurement and he, then he's drawing some conclusions off of that measurement. And then, uh, so we've, that's, we're gonna call that our first layer. And then uh, after that whole conclusion, now we've got Cavendish who's building another conclusion on top of that, uh, on top of that one. He's doing his experiment and uh, it's dependent upon uh, Eratosthenes' conclusion being correct. Is that right? Mm. Kind of layer upon well, yeah, layer. yeah. If, if the radius of the Earth is wrong, then, and if the density of the Earth depends on the volume of the Earth, which depends on the radius of the Earth, then yes, then the density of the Earth will be incorrect. Okay. Right. So yeah, I think and this is where it really uh, comes down yeah. to the important things here. Uh, I'm, I'm always pointing out, I call them uh, academic pitfalls, okay? uh, where you've got what looks like what looks to be solid ground. Then all of a sudden you get up there and you walk on it and poof, it just falls through on you. It's a tiger trap. Uh, that's another term I use for yeah. it. Yeah. And so Let me, it really <clears throat> depends on the foundation, everything underneath it. And so we've got a great observation here, uh, but it really depends upon the strength of everything underneath it. Um, all right, let's, let's uh, hear Blue, what Blue has to say. Yeah, yes and no. Uh, uh, when Cavendish did his experiment, given the way he went about doing his calculations, uh, he very easily would have, would have, could have gotten uh, a very wrong answer if, uh, the radius of the earth had been wrong. Mm -hmm. Now he, he stated it as the diameter of the earth. That's fine. Whatever radius diameter. If that had been wrong, he would have gotten the wrong answer without a doubt. Mm -hmm. No question about that. But I want you to notice that in the calculations we went through using, uh, using the, the, the modern methods and modern mathematics that we use today. No place in there did we ever talk about the earth. Mm -hmm. No place in there did we ever discuss the mass of the earth. No place in there were we ever dependent on anything to do with the earth or the earth's gravity. And this so is strictly... Your objective was, was different than his objective. His objective was to find out the density of the earth, but your objective was not. Is that right? My objective was to measure the universal gravitational constant. Yes, that's uh, that is that is technically a different objective than determining the density of the Earth. But okay. if you have one, you easily have the other. No matter which way you go, if you have the mass of the Earth, then you can immediately calculate the universal gravitational constant. If you have the universal gravita gravitational constant, you can immediately calculate the mass of the Earth. Okay, so we've got uh, the force of attraction uh, is what we're we're talking about. Okay, we're observing a force of attraction between two two different masses, and because yep. this exists, that tells us that the Earth has some kind of density, but we don't know what density that is. Is that what you're, is that what you're saying? I'm not, um, ask it again. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. So because we have, we, because we can observe uh, some movement between two different masses or some attraction between two different masses. Okay. Uh, that tells us that mass has a force and because mass has a force that means the earth has a force and so if the earth has a force as some kind of a density behind it uh does that make sense but we don't know what kind of density it is we just know that it has some kind of density Wait, there, there aren't kinds of density there's no flavors well there's different amounts there's different amounts there's quantity yeah quantity magnitude that's okay a, okay yeah that's what i mean kind of density it's uh there's a great amount of density versus a little amount of density. Okay. 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 So because the earth has density, that means it has some kind of a force behind it. And N -n -n density sorry, is not the, the, reliant on force. Sorry. It's the other way around. The force is reliant on the density, right? And so the more the, dense it is, the more force it's going to produce. 
Yes, the more downward. Okay. Yes, downward. Force. Yeah, downward force. Yeah, okay. which totally obliterates Einstein right there. No, because he said there no. was no force. He said gravity is not a force at all. It, no, that's not. I, Einstein didn't didn't debunk gravity. He didn't debunk Newton. He enhanced Newton by saying the exact opposite of what Newton said. No, he didn't He's, say. Einstein exact said opposite. gravity is not a force at all. In, no, he never said that. Uh, no, he didn't. Oh, that's not what the BBC says, and that's definitely well, well, not what National Geographic says. How, how about just look what he said instead of what third parties say? <laughs> right. Okay. Well, I, I've gone to. Uh, Einstein.net there you, and yeah, I, it's every source I can find on the matter. They all agree with me that he said that Einstein said you can in, that, you can infer that from from his field equations. You can infer that yes, uh, okay. no no question about that. Uh, Einstein himself, as far as I am aware, never one time ever said <laughs> that that he was. Re- refuting uh, anything Newton did. In fact, he said just exactly the opposite. There's a letter uh, written by Einstein to the London Times in 1920-something. I forget now when it was, but uh, I've got a copy of it, and I can show it to you, uh, where Einstein said that neither his work uh, nor any other would ever supersede the work of Newton ever. Well, it, it was, fact, it was, uh, it hold on, sound hold like on. he knew his work was wrong. <laughs> it was November 28th, 1919, page 13 okay. of the times. Uh-huh. Yeah. It sounds oh, like, it sounds to me like he was acknowledging that his work was wrong and Newton was right. No, he was acknowledging that they work together. Okay. So right. they work together. He enhanced, so- he enhanced Newton. He did not contradict him at all. In fact, um, Newton's field equations, I just went over this today, Newton's field equations reduce to the new- Newtonian uh, universal gravitational law. Okay. So at the weak field limit, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. So in fact, in another, in another writing, uh, let me say this too, in another writing, this is by Einstein as well. Einstein literally said this. He said that uh, any any theory of gravitation that did not return the Newtonian solution in the weak limit was wrong. It had to be discarded. So and he's, that's directly from Einstein. So right there again, he's refuting himself by saying not when a falling object is not really falling it's it's actually standing still that's an inertial reference frame here uh is and if, then yeah okay so einstein says a falling object is not really falling it's actually standing still okay and einstein is saying something completely opposite of newton here because newton said that object that is falling is actually moving towards the ground but einstein says no it's not moving towards the ground it's actually the ground moving upward to the object the, at least that's what dr perez said so yeah that's the equivalency formula or equivalency um, yeah the equivalency uh, did you watch my two videos did you watch my two videos about I, I, that? I watched i watched one of them not not both of them Okay. I'm wondering um, which one you watched. So, did you so watch the, the one about the math or did you watch the one uh, where I talked about the the principle itself? I, I don't remember. It was it was when it first came out. So probably the oh. whichever one was first, I think. But the thing is, he, he he was hypothesizing about a person in an elevator, right? Uh-huh. That uh, was not near the influence of any gravitational body. And if that was it if it was accelerating upward then you would feel a certain acceleration. And if it was also near, then not accelerating, but stationary and near a gravitational body, it would feel like acceleration. You could not identify the difference in those two, right? That's what he's talking about. That doesn't mean that it's not a force, okay. right? A, so force, that's... A, a force can do work. Uh huh. And work can be done with gravity, like turning that torsion bar that's work. 
Okay, so it sounds to me like you're saying Dr. Perezgiz was wrong because Dr. Perezgiz is the one who said that a falling apple is stationary in the air while the ground is moving up. And he even illustrated it out in, with the diagram. He also uh, compared it to the, the movement that you feel while riding in a train. And then he actually took the train and turned it vertical and said, okay, now we've got the train moving upward. You're feeling that backwards jolt in the train. That's gravity. And so it's actually yeah, it, it's, moving it's, upward, the ground moving it's, upward. It's just, it's just moving to different reference frames. Okay. So uh, that's his whole thing right there. And he said that this whole acceleration is caused by the curvature of space time. I was like, okay, that's great. That's the cause of it. The, yes. the cause is the curvature of space time. Perfect. And that's what's causing the ground to move upward to the apple. And so after that whole video and establishing that, I went and did another video where I talked about the math involved in that. And so we have mass times mass or sorry, force equals mass times acceleration. And so I said, okay, the mass of what? The mass of the entire earth times the acceleration of the entire earth. And I, <laughs> and so by that reasoning, everything on earth should weigh the exact same amount. Okay. No. Because it's the mass of the entire earth times the acceleration of the entire earth. And now I've heard some people it's, tell me, no, that's not the case. It's actually the mass of the falling object times the acceleration. It's F, the F equals F equals what? M times acceleration. A, right. So M yeah. is mass. Okay. The mass of what? The mass of the object. The okay. The mass of the, so the mass of the falling. Which object? Is it the mass of the Earth that's moving, or is the it the mass, mass of, of the stationary object? The mass of object? the apple, for example. Okay. The mass of the apple. Okay. So in that instance, okay. We've got a projectile and an obstacle, okay? The, the, uh, because the projectile is the thing that's moving, okay? And we have the obstacle. And so if you're saying it's actually the mass of the apple, uh, that is going to be the obstacle. And the earth itself, that's gonna be the projectile because the earth is the thing that's moving. And so by that whole reasoning, if I were to launch an ant at an elephant, that ant should hit the elephant with a whole bunch of force because the elephant has a lot of mass. But no. that's not the case. No, and the so ant, we, can, ant, we can flip You a, multiply the, the mass of the ant times the, the velocity squared to get the amount of energy in it. We take the... the okay, so we take the, the ant, okay? Yeah, when you have something... Which has very little... Yeah, little very little mass, itself. right? And it's the velocity uh -huh. squared. It's not F equals MA when you're talking about how much it's hitting the elephant with. It. And so uh -huh. the the it doesn't hit the elephant with force. It hits the elephant with energy. Okay. E equals mass times velocity squared. It's a different okay. equation. So, well, we're, we're talking about force here, which is force equals mass okay. it, times acceleration. Yeah, so but it's, you're it's saying the that... force. It's the force applied over time that that results in a velocity. But when, mm -hmm. but when the ant actually hits the elephant, it's the amount of energy that it's, um, that it's applying to the elephant. That's um, mass times velocity squared. Okay, so you're saying it's not force. So now we're kind of eliminating the entire force equation here. No, we're... no, no. Like I said, from when you... The, 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 the velocity of the ant gets, gets modified by force. But once the ant is be, is contacting the elephant, mm -hmm. it's the amount of energy that you're talking about. So, you, so the the the, now we're the force, about the force. The, but the for, yeah, that's in the past, right? That's already done its stuff. Now it's about the velocity and the mass hitting the elephant. So that's not what you care about. You care about the amount of of time applied to accelerating the ant, right? That's F equals ma. Okay, so we've got. Force equals mass times acceleration. So we're taking uh, the force of the ant, okay? The ant doesn't it, have force. The ant doesn't have force? It has okay. mass. We've got... It has mass. Okay. Then what were we... Okay. We've got... An, I, I don't know what the... you're getting at. But let's do this. Think about it for a second. I got a couple super chats. I want to give Blue a few more uh, right. chances to talk about this because it's kind of a different topic. And PhD okay. Tony has requested coming in, and I think he <laughs> might have a little better uh, angle at this and um, than than Blue because Blue Blue 
Blue did this this amazing experiment. I think that's what we should uh, that's the main point here. And so why don't we wrap that up and then we'll move on. And I think it might be an interesting conversation for this other part. Okay, so yeah, I got okay. a whole video on that, and so I've been yeah, kind of curious about that because this whole thing okay. is. Oh, uh, Save yeah, it. This whole Save thing. It. Okay. Save it. Yep, right. yep, yep. Okay. Delcos man has a second prediction. This is for you, but don't respond yet. Uh, he says he'll try to wiggle out of this harder than Thompson with Witsit's money in a van. <laughs> I look forward to hearing his wiggle attempt. You got a little preview there. Uh, Joshua Elek said, Blue Marble, can you explain the difference between gravity and gravitation? Interesting uh, question. Did you get that blue? Oh, Oops, you might be. Mike there, yeah, you were, you were muted, yeah. Mike was turned off. The difference was between gravity and gravitation. I'm not sure where we're going with that. Um, Can I say hi? Okay. Yeah, I don't know if it's, if it's just a semantic thing it to me it is uh i don't see the difference yeah there you go maybe phd tony can can uh expand on that uh i've got real cygnus for 199 has a super, super chat but no message thank you very much uh wrote it no last name says can your guest at least admit that blue mar uh, blue marble science so this is to you kyle has done his due diligence in isolating variables in his Cavendish apparatus. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. I think he's done a good job at setting things up and really trying to figure things out. And I can't see yeah, anything wrong about that. All right. Nothing comes to my immediate attention anyway. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I love it. It's pretty, it's awesome. I, I, certainly I think it's, try it's, to, it's very to, apparent that there is a force involved there. So yeah, I, I totally give you credit for that. So I like this one, Joshua. Yeah, that was a, oh, keep going. Go ahead. I was just, I, I don't want to interrupt the, go ahead with the super chats. And okay. I, all right. I'll get back to what I was going to say. Uh, Joshua Alex said, Newton measured things with a yardstick and said, that's one and a half yards long. A yardstick. Einstein used a ruler and said, it's one foot, eight inches, eight no unit long. There you go. It's more precise. And then Quiddies says, I get a free super chat, so chew the goo. Okay. Chew the goo. All right, uh, Blue, what are you going to do with this? Um, and um, what's your future plans? This thing has a... Uh has a, a date certain when it will be relocated uh, to the Department of Physics and Astronomy at the University of Tennessee. So it is going to a new home. And uh, it will be used as a, as a teaching aid. Um, they teach, the, of course, like every university does that has a physics curriculum. They they teach this uh, this exact experiment. You learn a lot of things, you know, at the, in the process of of, of dealing with uh, with Cavendish. There are a lot of engineering principles, uh, important engineering principles involved, and in physics principles. Um, so I'm really happy that that, that uh, the thing will have a life after uh, I'm done with it. I mean, because, because otherwise, basically, what I've got is a pile of firewood and some really big fishing weights. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I, uh, tr I truthfully find that but one of the more amazing parts uh, of this whole thing when you think about it that way we literally have measured the universal gravitational constant with nothing more than some firewood and some fishing weights that's phenomenal and all and and you can't say enough about the thought process that uh, john michelle and henry cavendish and those guys 223 years ago uh had it is absolutely astounding that that they were able to to uh to think this thing up uh 
I don't think about it. I, I could live long enough to ever come up with it on my own. That's for sure. But I was going to say something about, uh, about Newton, um, that you should keep in mind that Newton, uh, Newton literally said, do not ascribe innate gravity to me. He said those words, uh, Newton was and remained his entire life upset over the idea that he could not pinpoint a reason mass would attract mass. There was no apparent reason for it. And, and that's the reason he said that don't ascribe innate gravity. I don't want you saying that. I say that's just something that gravity, gravity is just, just a property of mass. And that's the end of it. I can't tell you why. Um, it wasn't until Einstein came along and said, okay, I can explain why. And that's the difference in Einstein and Newton. Einstein added the explanation. Einstein gave us a, a reason for why it happened. Newton was never able to do that. The hard Nobody part could with, until the hard part about Einstein that is just on. it doesn't make sense to me when he's when you say I can explain why by totally ignoring the fact that you claim it's a force. I, yeah, it's just a misunderstanding. Um, <clears throat> so, and like I said, hopefully, PhD Tony, I'll, I'll send you, I send that uh, link in just a second mm -hmm. here, Tony. Um, <clears throat> so, for people wondering, I have a debate lined up with uh, the guy that claims to be the reincarnation of two Egyptian gods, um, and he <laughs> he's moved it back an hour, so. We have another hour from now when that starts. Yes, Kyle. He he does claim that he is the reincarnation of Ra and Thoth. Both. Okay. Both somehow. He's a bit uh interesting guy. Uh so Mr. United for the Children says hats off to Blue for an incredible job well done. And I agree. It is it is a uh Thank you. Because I've I've read I've read, on my website mc2.net slash g I have a bunch of different experiments measuring the gravitational constant and you can tell these people have budget um, they they the, the lengths that they're able to go to is so much more they're not making that out of wood they're they're custom manufacturing steel enclosures and um, oh my god doing yeah. them inside of vacuum chambers. Uh, and they're getting, you know, five, six digits of precision. Uh, yeah. And if you want to get, uh, what did I get to? Uh, we, we uh, I guess I didn't, I didn't mention what the results were. Oh, yeah. Cavendish shot within about 1%, uh, through 46 tests. I got within about a half percent. So a little bit better than Cavendish, not, you know, remarkably better, but a little bit. Uh, so, uh, half percent is what, uh, uh, in PPM. Pretty good. Uh, right, that's 5,000 parts per day. Is that right? Oh, I don't, I can't do that in my head. So, you know, to the, the, the really good tests these days get within 15 or 20 PPM. Um, uh, Okay. I spent, well, say $3,000 on this thing. The really good guys probably spend $3 million. You want the accuracy, you're going to pay the money. Yeah. And you, you're going to pay a lot of money. Those, uh, those high dollar university grade, uh, uh, super precision Cavendish, you know, torsion balance experiments are very, very expensive to fabricate. The tolerances are incredible. And then every every about ten years they redo the BIPM uh, measurements for the different universal constants. Yeah. So the last was in twenty fourteen, I think. So I'm sure they're working on it right now on the twenty twenty four or whatever version of it. Yep. So Okay, let's see. We've got uh, Flower of the Land says, hashtag chew the goo. This can't be forgotten so easily. Um, I have some 
Somebody sent me some Rocky Mountain oysters. They're terrible. Um, <clears throat> and John Rapp says, 10 out of 10 going to Tennessee. Aptly awesome. There you go. <laughs> You know that that that'd be that'd be cool if. Uh, do you know when it's going? Is there a date? Yeah, I'd rather not say that. Okay, okay. Well, at some point, uh, I, I, is it going to be somewhere that could be viewed, or would you have to have an appointment to go see it? I I, uh, I don't know. Yeah. I I would imagine there's there there certainly must be a way. Uh, mm. I'll investigate that. Yeah, that'd be cool. Because uh, I mean, if we uh, we travel, <clears throat> we go on vacation, bring our kids around. It'd be a great thing to bring them to see. So <laughs> they're like, "Dad, oh, do we have to? Come on, it's exciting." No, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> Your kids are gonna uh, hate me. <laughs> they're good sports. So, all right, I'm gonna tell you what. Blue, anything else uh, you wanna wanna cover here? You wanna talk about? No, no. Let's uh, let's get Tony in here. All right. I sent I sent the uh, the the link to Tony. Have you, uh, Kyle? Have ever spoken with Tony? I believe I have on Mister Sensible's channel. PhD Tony. Okay. Yep. Uh, Mallory Mallory says that Blue is so wholesome. Blue, are you that wholesome? I'm not wholesome. <laughs> uh, Kyle, is that the official flat earth map behind you? That is a representation of one. It's, yeah. So that's the Gleason map. Is it, is it accurate? No, <laughs> no. I agree. <laughs> yeah. But it's more accurate than a lot of maps out there. So I'll, get, I'll say that much. So, all right. Yeah. We've I, got... I've, I recently went and looked at the Martellus map, which is another flat earth map uh, that uh, Yale University actually says greatly influenced Columbus. So I thought that was extremely interesting when I found out that Columbus was using a flat earth map the whole time. So He wasn't using a flat earth map. If you look at it, look at it. It's got an ice wall around it and everything. It's, it looks like the Gleason map here behind me, minus the Americas in it. So Hi. there is PhD Tony. Welcome. Hello. Um, so I wanted to clarify some things um, about this entire gravity is not a forced discussion. Um, so what Einstein actually said is that the laws of physics have to be the same regardless of the reference frame you're in, and that includes accelerating reference frames. Um, and you have to consider this because you can't tell whether or not you're in an accelerating reference frame or if there's some external force acting on a, acting on a ball. By looking at this, he determined that every object in the universe will move along a path of minimum action or a geodesic or a world line um, that corresponds to the curvature of space-time. That's what every object in the universe will do unless it's acted upon by a force, right? So when something is falling, that's what it's doing. It is moving along that geodesic, that world So you're line. saying it is not stationary like, uh, like Dr. Perizga has said. From its, from its perspective, it is. It, you can, the thing about Einstein is that you can look at it from both perspectives. You can either look at it from the perspective of the falling object, in which case nothing's happened to it. It's, it's not subject to a force. Um, it, the, rest of the, the rest of the universe is moving. But if I take, for instance, an observer at the center of mass of the Earth, that observer is also tracing their geodesic through space-time, but they observe this other observer accelerating towards them. From, their, from this perspective, this person, again, has no force acting on them. They're, at the, they're, at the, um, they're on their geodesic, but they don't see the surface of the Earth accelerating. So the apparent acceleration of the Earth is unique to this observer and his frame of reference, right? So when they say the surface of the Earth is accelerating upwards, 
that's from this observer's point of view. Okay. Right? It's not from a generic point of view. Another observer who's falling in another thing sees the, sees the surface of the Earth accelerating in a different direction. Um, so... So, uh, so, so I, I understand this, this whole, it depends on your, I understand the whole, it depends on your perspective, uh, the whole thing. Yep. Okay. It depends on your reference frame. Are, are you, uh, yeah, I, I, under, I get where that you're coming from there, but that whole thing, uh, it, there's a thing about the actual thing and then there's the illusion thing. And that's what happens with fictitious forces. Yep. So there, um, so I, I looked at, if I can, not the Coriolis, if it, I can, uh, go ahead. If I can clarify, okay, so what's actually happening, or at least the way I think about it, an object that is falling is not undergoing any force, right? It's, it's moving along the gravitational geodesic. Um, so gravity is not a force in that perspective. The ground, on the other hand, can't fall. It wants to. It really wants to move down that geodesic, right? But it can't. Um, and because there are forces that are stopping it from moving down, which is to say the intermolecular um, and interatomic bonds of the weak and strong and electromagnetic forces of the solids that comprise the Earth. They want to go inwards, but they can't because the material is stopping that from happening. So you are not falling. And the reason you're not falling is because the surface you're resting on is applying a force that stops you from moving along that geodesic. And that's your weight, right? Your weight is the surface pushing, stopping you from moving along your geodesic. You are not following your geodesic through space time at the moment because the surface you're on is preventing it, right? Mm -hmm. You're being stopped from going on that. And that's where weight comes from. Weight is not actually... The, you, you will hear in classrooms that we simply that we that we adopt a very Newtonian attitude. We say weight is the force down, but actually weight is the upward force. Mm -hmm. um, it's measuring the it's it's the it's the force that the that the surface you're on is applying in order to stop you from moving under gravity. So and the, and the thing is that it's not a matter if you restrict yourself to just the Earth, just the Earth you can't really tell the difference between Einstein and Newton, right? They're both extremely accurate formulations of what's going to happen. Einstein, the difference only comes into play, the observational validation of Einstein only comes into play in more extreme settings, um, in particular the gravitational field of the sun. So the bending of the curvature of light as it passes near the sun or the precession of the perihelion of the orbit of Mercury as it orbits the sun. Those were the two deal breakers where people, where Einstein was able to explain the precession of Mercury. People knew there was a problem with the precession of Mercury. They'd calculated it using Newtonian theory. And they said, oh, there's a tiny problem here. It's not big, but it's big enough that we're certain that there's a problem there. And Einstein came up with this theory and he said, look, my theory explains that away. Um, but it also predicts this other stuff. If my theory is true, this other stuff should occur. So people went out and they looked at the other stuff and sure enough, they found that it occurred. So, but if you're a flat earther, you don't accept any of that um, be, you, because you don't accept that Mercury is a planet being observed from a spheroidal Earth orbiting the sun. You don't accept the distance to the sun and the mass of the sun um, in, um, the, that was used in the Eddington experiment. So you don't get to reference Einstein at all. From your perspective, Einstein has already been debunked. And so we can stick to just a Newtonian formulation of gravity and you don't have to understand relativity, but we can demonstrate Newtonian gravity. Now, there was a lot of discussion about there being a force demonstrated in the Cavendish experiment. That, strictly speaking, that's not true. What the Cavendish experiment shows is that the motion of the test mass is influenced by the proximity of another mass. In other words, the mass distribution controls the motion of particles. It exerts a what technically we call a gravitational influence. So you're and saying there was in no projectile involved there? 
There, well, I mean, define the term projectile. Uh, object moving. When an object in motion can, can be described as a projectile. Okay, relative, relative, free, free, to, free relative to what? So you need to choose your frame of reference and you need to define it properly, right? From okay. the point of view of the, of the ball, perhaps everything else was moving. You know, we, when we look at these test and, test and object balls. So you're um, talking about the so person, from our perspective, the camera, everything else in the entire room was all moving and- the... Yeah, so, 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 but pick one of them. Okay, pick the person, say. There is a movement, there is a mo relative movement of this ball because of the gravitational influence of that ball because the curvature of space-time was changed by the presence of that ball. And so because that ball became present, that ball, there was a, there was a, there was a gravitational influence exerted, space-time, the warp of space-time was bent, and that object moved in response. So it's okay. geodesic so through space-time. If, if one object is moving and the other one is stationary, it doesn't matter which one, one of them is going to be a projectile and the other one is not. Um, uh, as long as I there's one ball moving I think, and the other one's not, doesn't matter I think either way. You're, I think you're hung up on the term projectile. For me, a projectile is something that has been projected. Okay, um, so, so something's been, and that um, just means so something that's been put into motion in the air. Um, yes, and Einstein's point is that everything's in motion all the time. Uh huh. Right. That's the native. You know, even though we don't feel like we're in motion, that's the native state. We are actually, you know, we're not moving under Earth's gravitational field, but we are moving under the suns and we're moving under the gravities. We're moving under the rest of the universes. We are tracing geodesics um, through space time um, in accord with the curvature, with the, with, you know, the curvature of space time that we call gravity. So that's occurring. Right, so you saying something is stationary, prove it. Prove that it's stationary, because right, that's the question for Brian Cox, because it was Brian Cox's claim when he did the the bowling ball and the feather in the vacuum chamber. Uh, Brian Cox specifically said that uh, the bowling ball and the feather fell at the exact same rate because, and these are his words, not mine, because they are not actually falling; they're standing still. Right. This is all saying that the Earth is accelerating this upward. Is, this to is from the bowling, this is bowling ball. This is from this is from their perspective. Yes, from their perspective, they are they they're not being acted on by a okay. force. And so okay, so, so but 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 um, it, um Brian Cox is um Brian Cox in that snippet is a um try, attempting popular science education so you need to be cautious that he's not using proper scientific terminology and b is neglecting other gravitational influences such as due to the sun due to the other planets in the in the solar system and due to the rest of the galaxy and you know other extra galactic bodies um, and he ignores those because their effects are small but if you step back to a different frame of reference you are going to see both the bowling ball and the feather moving in these other gravitational um, reference frames. So Brian Cox's statement is approximately correct, but it's not absolutely technically perfect. Um, and, 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 you know, this was Einstein's genius was in, re in being able to work out laws of physics, you know, uh, how to look at gravity in such a way that it doesn't matter what reference frame you're considering, you're going to get the right results. Okay. Right. So you can change so, reference right. frames arbitrarily. You're going to get the same behavior. All right. So Dr. Perez gives the title of his video was uh, "Is Gravity an Illusion?" And the whole ending point of his video that according to Einstein, gravity is an illusion. That was the whole point of the video. Do you agree? Um. Uh. No, I don't. Um, but I think that's a very so, semantic. Okay, so you disagree but that's a, with that. That's a semantic. Um, please allow me to explain. That's a semantic. Um, that's a semantic slash um, philosophical dispute rather than anything. I can see what he means by the idea that gravity is an uh, gravity is an illusion. Um, the fact that we can treat it as a force. Yes, it's 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 not actually a force. 
it is the natural way that all objects move through space time. So that's philosophically, gravity. you disagree with with uh, Dr. Perez Giz. That's um, what you're telling No. Me. So you um, well, yes. philosophically um, agree so with him. That let me is... let me let me let me let me state let me state my position. Gravity is real, right? It's not an illusion. The way things move under the influence of gravity is real. Okay. It's not a real force. That, so if he's if he is saying the force of gravity is an illusion, yes, that's an illusion. But if he is saying that there is no such thing as gravitational effects whatsoever, he's wrong. Okay. So you agree with him, but you don't agree with him. And so I'm kind of... I'm well, I don't... I, all I'm saying is I haven't seen his particular video on this and I don't know what he said, but I will, but I will also point out to you that actually most meaningful scientific discussion does not occur on YouTube or in popular science education videos. So if you want somebody who's stating their position formally correctly, you should be reading scientific papers, not watching simplified versions that are designed to be digestible by the general public. Okay. So you've got a so. problem with that's a, oh, Kyle, a that's a, that's a great point. And, and, as as a homeschool educator, I know it very well. My young kids are not doing algebra. They can't do it yet. I need to give them the non-algebra stuff before they get to algebra. So it's similar in something digestible, as he says, digestible to the, the public. You don't give them algebra, you give them arithmetic. So you're getting the arithmetic version of, of Einstein when to really understand it, you don't just need the algebra version of it, right? You need the differential equation version of it. So instead of actually showing an observation, you'd rather just see it in written words. Well, we do know you're, you're ignoring the fact that actually um, Einstein did his, did his calculations precisely to explain observations and that his results were subsequently validated um, using observations, no, we my, still my comment use... here was about the use of YouTube not and versus paper, and so I'm talking about um, having written well, words describing a, a dog is brown versus actually showing you that a dog is brown. I can show, I can write it to you, or I can actually show it to you with a camera. Okay, and that's you your can big show it to here. me, but you can't explain to me. You know, if you want the technical details of what of how dyes in dog hair works um and um and the genetic factors that govern a dog's um dog's coloring you're not going to get that off a youtube video i right? can show well okay now that's a whole nother question here is do i have to count every single hair on a dog in order to say the dog is brown um or, or, or the dog is depends, furry. that depends on that depends on the meaning that you ascribe to the um, to the statement, the dog is brown. What what are you stating? I, I said brown instead of furry. I meant to say furry. Okay. I my my whole point here is I don't have to count every single hair on a dog in order to make the claim that the dog is furry. I can just show you, and you can see for yourself and make that own your own judgment call and yes. be able to say, oh, that dog is furry. I don't need to count every yes. single hair on it. And if that. relativity were that simple, yes, you could do science via YouTube's. But the reality is, Kyle that the science that is done is sufficiently complicated that it cannot be adequately communicated via YouTube videos and popular education. Do you know what I mean when I refer to, when I refer to the precession of the perihelion of Mercury? I'm not familiar enough with on the topic. So I, okay. Yeah. So in Mercury's orbit, there's a perihelion. There's a point where it is closest to the sun during its uh -huh. orbit. Yeah. Right. And that point moves through time. The, it processes is what, it, what it's called. Uh -huh. um, so and you don't think there's a video on YouTube about that? Um, there probably is. But in order to understand how Einstein. Okay. And I'm wondering. Okay. Just, um...
But in order to understand how Einstein correctly predicted, you know, correctly modeled that requires a degree of algebra. Um, it requires mathematical understanding. And maybe there's a YouTube video about that, but you seem not to have watched it. You seem to be watching popular education videos and popular education videos are not going to sit you down and walk you through tensor calculus. They're not going to sit you down and walk you through um, uh, and walk you through how you make observations of the precession of, perihel of, of the perihelion of um, Mercury's orbit, or how you um, do the calculations. Now, that's where I really to, like to look to, at the foundational uh, levels. Second. So okay. Tony, Tony, and and Kyle, um, you can you can on YouTube actually. There's multiple videos on the derivation of Einstein's field equations. Right. Right. Go through them. And when you understand them, I've I've personally watched several of them. I have not reached that level yet. Um, then, then you have the foundation covered. Okay. But so, until but you're I there, you don't have the foundation. Of, yeah. That was my whole understanding of the whole Dr. Perezka's video was talking about Einstein's foundational levels. And so there's understanding it at the primary levels, and then there's the secondary and the tertiary. And you're talking about having these levels way up here that you need to understand with the the deep uh, papers, the scientific papers and published reviews and things like that, right? They're way up here, but all of that stuff, it, it's all built upon the really basic foundations. And that's what I really try to get. If I can get past the first foundations and say, okay, all this stuff checks off, then I can go on to the next one and then the next one and building up on that. But there's no point in going all the way up here if it's all broken down here. Does that make sense? It's just that um, you no. won't find that it's broken though. Um, well, uh, I'd, I'd, I'd like to, I'd like to, I'd like yeah. to respond to that. No, it doesn't. Um, it doesn't make any sense whatsoever. If you try to reconstruct the body of human knowledge starting from scratch, you are not going to succeed. You are certainly not going to be able to do it in one lifetime, right? This is why we trust people, we trust other researchers who have done stuff. And this is why we have set up peer review in the way that we have. I don't need to do every science experiment. I don't need to personally derive every equation that has ever been derived. I trust that the people who are working in their particular disciplines are doing so with, um, uh, uh, with competence and honesty. Now, I, when I take, that does lead to a field because people do become so specialized that they just take results from other fields and don't realize that they've made a mistake. Um, that that is something of a weakness with this approach, but um, we try to keep one another in check through the peer review process. So it's not perfect, but if you say I want to rebuild, starting from you know caveman level understanding and building my way up to Einstein, you're never going to get there. Never. Yeah, um, you, have, you have to rest uh, on something. You have to. You know yeah. you. you, you it, it's too vast an undertaking for you to attempt, and you're wasting your life trying it. Um, you know, and 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 I've I've tried multiple times to convince you to to try and sort of use your use your time on this planet more productively, um, but it seems not to be something that you want to do. Um, it, the The simple fact is that watching these popular education videos does not equip you with enough understanding of the theory to attempt the debunks you're trying to do and you're trying to perform. And actually, you know, I, I, I did watch both of your videos, your video about the Rocky Mountains, for instance. Um, and I have video to say, the Rocky Mountains. Oh, that was you said that, that, was the, my, the, that was the, like... That was back in August. That was the. Huh. Um, the that, that was, was before I did the whole Einstein's failure video. That was one just. Um, yes, I saw Einstein's failure. I saw I saw Einstein's failure as well. And there's Einstein's um, failure you, too, which talked about the. <coughs> yes, if I may respond to the Rocky Mountains example, because I feel that it quite clearly distills the um, the failure of your reasoning. MC Toon said that gravity disproves a flat Earth um, because of the potato theory. 
um, which is to say that once things get beyond a certain scale, they'll tend to crumple into a ball um, under the influence of self-gravitation. And you said, what about the Rocky Mountains? Um, you know they're really big. They should they should deform into they should deform in, um, under self gravitation. Self gravitation uh, by definition only applies if the gravity of the body is the only physical influence at play. If you took the Rocky Mountains out into space, far away from any other body, and left them for a while, they would deform into a spherical body. But on assuming Earth, that the force is stronger than the force, uh, does that make sense? Assuming that yeah, the, yes, the, the assuming, gravitational assuming, force assuming, is stronger than the than the bar force, the assuming force the, that the influence of gravity is, um, you know, again, I would I, I I would suggest that you um, stick to the term influence of gravity rather than force of gravity. But yes, but we know the material strength of the Rocky Mountains. We know the material strength of rocks. So we know um, that uh, self-gravitation is sufficiently strong to overcome the- So um, the weak force of gravity is stronger than the material force of the rocks. That's what you're telling me. Um, yes, on, well, on once it, once a it gets sufficiently large, large scale, enough, yeah. yes. Yeah, um, so it's not, gravity is not large enough to pull molecule from molecule but it is certainly large enough to deform the crystalline lattice um, uh, uh, into, into, a spherical, into a spherical shape. Yes. So, so it, it's, um, it's strong enough to break the rock in half and crunch it down. Um, uh, rocks, uh, the, what you'll find is actually, yes, the rock will um, fail. Um, it will under, it will start to undergo brittle failure and it will start to undergo liquid, much like the Earth does. I mean, like that's that's how we get mountains in the first place, right? Two um, continent, well, two continental plates collide, and they and they jut up like that, right? Because okay, so the rock is deformed. I can take my right. I could take a granite countertop, okay, and I could measure about how much strength it takes to buckle that countertop in half. And you're telling me that gravity, which is a weak force, has enough strength to buckle a countertop in half. With enough with enough mass, you get um, you get enough actually gravity. What, actually, what you're this is this is the thing that you're overlooking, which is um, try um, try that same experiment with a granite countertop that is four thousand miles long, and uh -huh. see how hard it is to break then. Because leverage is a really powerful thing, right? Yeah. So if I apply even a relatively small force at the end of a 4,000-mile-long um, 4, fulcrum, right, it's going to break stuff in the middle because it's operating at, mach it's operating at mechanical advantage. Okay. So it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. You know, the, 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 the whole idea of the, um, the whole idea, of, you know, and this is why, um, this is why we say the cutoff is about uh, a, a radius of 300 miles. If you took your granite countertop and threw it into space, would gravity deform it sufficiently in order to turn it into a sphere? No, it would not, right? It would remain a granite countertop forever and ever until it got hit by something else or got sucked into a, yeah. um, a star or whatever because there's not enough, there's not enough leverage for gravity to um, for gravity to get any traction, for gravity to start breaking down the crystalline structure that gives the granite countertop its its shape. But if you go out with even you know with, with a few hundred with a granite top a few hundred miles long, and you should have some experience of this, right? You can break a uh, you know a really long um, piece of anything um, with much less force than it takes to break a really short piece yeah. of the same material, right? Um, the longer so the lever, the, the easier it is. The less amount of yeah, force. Yeah, that's right. So, so, so you know, it's it's not a matter. You know, yes, gravitation is a is a reasonably weak force, but once you get onto large scales, it becomes the only player in town, pretty much. Um, uh, right. It it becomes the dominant player in town, not the only and that's where, player in town. And that's where this whole thing comes down to the the potato principle itself depends upon the center of of 
the, the center being the strong, the suction point. Does that make sense? The mass attracting is right there in the center. Uh, and that that's what it all revolves around. But if you I have mean, a, I mean, many points all the way around it in different locations, and if it all could, if it all could be balanced, then the potato principle has no power. Yes, that's right. So the so if you've got a if you've got the right distribution of mass, um, you can get a you can get a reasonably steady configuration. But the um, uh, more technically, actually, you have to do it bit by bit. So this point mass approximation everything pulls towards the center of mass. That's an approximation that only, that doesn't actually often work. So if you look at the gravitational field of Earth, you'll see that there are some points with higher gravitational acceleration because there's lots of heavy minerals under the ground. And there are some points with lower gravitational attraction because there's light material under the ground, like a gas reservoir or something like that. Um, uh, so you can see, and, and indeed mineral companies use this to find mineral deposits. They take gravity measurements and they say, and then once they've discovered something, they'll go, well, I wonder how deep that is. They'll drill a hole and they'll put a gravity meter down the borehole and they'll take measurements of the gravity that, the, that it records. And that'll tell it from taking measurements at different depths you can tell at what depth your um, your gravity anomaly is. Now, I've heard a um, couple of people talk about that in the past, and I've been really curious about that, about these gravity measurements. Are they measuring like gravitons? Exactly what are they measuring here? So generally what they do is they use a gravimeter. There are various styles of gravimeter. Um, the most um, precise gravimeter um, commercially available is the Lacroix. Lacoste, the Lacoste FG5, um, which uh, operates by dropping a corner reflector. So it has a corner reflector. It has a tube, a drop tube. It drops a corner reflector and it tracks the trajectory of the corner reflector using a laser. So it fires a laser at the corner reflector as it, as it comes down to track the trajectory that the, um, that the object follows. Now, so there are a lot... Has so to do with a laser. I'm I'm really confused so about that. The laser measures the distance. So the laser is here. The laser fires a beam up at the corner reflector. The um, the laser comes back down. So the um, so at any point in time, that is used to calculate the distance between the laser and the corner cube. Okay. As the corner cube drops, as it falls, the laser is constantly pinging the um, uh, picking the corner reflector and taking measurements at each point during the drop. Okay, okay, so so more precisely, we're hanging another pendulum and the more tension no, gets no pulled on the pendulum. No, there's no pendulum. That, you, that's, you, there you there are pendulums. No, the, you drop the corner reflector. You, you okay, pull so it up mechanically and then you drop it so that it falls. Okay, so it's, it's measuring... Okay. The speed of the fall? Yeah, it's measuring time. the speed of the fall. It's measuring the speed of the fall as a function of time. So how quickly is this corner mass accelerating downwards relative, okay. to the, relative to the laser? Okay, so that's one way of doing it. There are what are called cold atom gravimeters, um, which um, they super cool atoms using a laser. It's really cool. And then they drop them. And, and they hit them with a laser during the drop. And from the, from the population of spin characteristics at the bottom, they can reconstruct how quickly those atoms dropped. Um, so that's a cold atom gravimeter. There are um, superconducting gravimeters, um, which use a ball in a magnetic field um, that is maintained by a superconductor. If there is any change in the force on the ball, the ball will want to move. But as soon as it moves, it will induce a current in the superconductor that will push it back to where it came from. So by measuring the current going through the superconductor, we can reconstruct the forces that have been applied to this ball. Okay. Um, uh, there, there, are, there are pendulum ones where you, you can measure gravity by looking at the timing of a pendulum. Uh -huh. There are um, spring ones. 
um, where you measure the displacement of a, of a spring. Oh, that's um, what I was thinking of. That's yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, so there are there are a bunch of different ways of doing this. Um, uh, cold atom gravimeters so are it's, becoming it's measuring much the more... effects of the force without measuring the force itself, basically. Yeah, We're it's measuring the acceleration. Kind of... Yeah. So we're it's not looking at generally you're measuring the acceleration. Okay. So we're not looking at gravity itself. We're just measuring the effects of it. Yes. We're measuring the effects of it. We're measuring the acceleration of test bodies. Um, well, the, the superconducting gravimeter is measuring a force, right? Uh -huh. It's directly measuring a force. Um, and so is the spring one. The spring one is measuring the force that is, uh -huh. um, that is applied to the spring. Um, okay. So those ones, so those ones are, uh, are measuring the force, and the other ones are just measure. Uh, they're dropping. They're basically drop, called drop gravimeters. You you drop something and you measure how quickly it falls. Um, okay. So yeah. yeah, and they both you can intercompare them. You can test them against one another. Okay. Yeah. So I'm. Yeah. There's a lot of people out there who really are just bashing against uh, the force. And uh, I'm not really one of those people who are out there bashing against this, this force that we call gravity. I just say, hey, there's a force. There's, I can acknowledge it, uh, but I don't really get yeah, the whole thing about the, I don't really, the disconnect for me comes from the whole claim that this force or the existence of this force disproves the flat earth. And that's my disconnect. I don't, I don't make okay. that connection. I don't make it either. Um, because, um, you know, and this is despite MC, you know, despite the potato principle, um, because it relies on a number of assumptions being made um, about, the, um, about the physical strength of the earth. We don't, we don't actually know that it isn't strong enough to withstand gravity. We don't know the distribution of mass outside, you know, assuming that you've got a disk, um, that extends on. Perhaps you can have a distribution of um, distribution of mass. You know, perhaps um, the, the the that will compensate for this, and the bit we're on is is flat. But the you know outside of that. So I don't necessarily consider gravity a killer for the flat Earth, but I'll, it does. I'll celebrate that common ground. Um, but it does very much damage a lot of the arguments that flat Earthers rely on. Um, you know, so like Eric um, Dubay is the one who is a, a major yeah. one who says that uh, that I don't remember what his exact claim was of uh, like word for word, but he says that uh, was it density itself is a force, and I I don't connect with that. Yeah, well, I mean that the, there are there are many 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 tests and validations of Newtonian gravity. And indeed, you know, Einstein, Einstein's equations are really, really complicated, very difficult to solve. Um, and the most common technique, the one that was used by Einstein himself, is to say, OK, let's start with the Newtonian solution and let's apply, let's apply little deviations from that and mm -hmm. see how that's, that behaves. And the differences between Newtonian theory and Einsteinian theory only become important when you're in a strong gravitational field or when one of the objects is moving really, really quickly. Uh -huh. um, um, so in those two conditions, um, uh, you, you start to see the accuracy of the Einsteinian theory over the Newtonian theory. But again, yeah. as I was saying earlier, on Earth, you're not going to really see any difference. Okay. Yeah, that, then that's kind of the whole disconnect there is that Dr. Perezkis's video and Brian Cox's video, who are saying the opposite of Einstein, that where they're saying opposite things. Okay, so the 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 thing about the thing to remember about Brian, Brian Cox, at least, is that he's an astrophysicist. So, uh -huh. um, so he will, you know, so for him, you know, there's abundant evidence of the inadequacy of Newtonian um, Newtonian gravity in you know galaxy dynamics. Um, the bending of light, gravitational lensing from different objects, blah, you know, there's just this, there's just this rigmarole of data that he has that he accepts as valid um, uh, that shows Newton is Newton, you know, doesn't doesn't explain things well in a lot of circumstances. 
But if you're just looking at Earth, it's a different story entirely. If you're just looking at stuff on the surface of Earth, it's very difficult to distinguish between Newtonian and um, Einsteinian gravity. And there's a thing called newton cartan theory, which um, is an extension of Newton's theory, but not fully extended to Einstein's extent, that will also explain gravitational redshift. Um, so in that case, you can't even use the pound Rebker experiment to distinguish mm -hmm. between um, the, various, um, the various possibilities. Okay. Uh, I've got a, we've got a couple questions for Tony. Mm -hmm. uh, but first, we've got referring to your map there, uh, Kyle. Mister United for the Children says it's not the greatest flat Earth map in the world, but it's a tribute to the greatest flat Earth map in the world. Okay. Uh, why kick a mook house? Is so after two hours, is Mallory the best furry ever? Kyle. Is Mallory the best furry ever? I don't know who Mallory is. I think Mallory is just LARPing as a furry. Could be wrong. She's... I just think of Mallory from Studio C, and that's all that's coming was, to my mind. I was thinking of Family Ties. Um, oh. Holy Smalls, Tony, this is for you. Tony just used every other term that the normal force to then the normal force to describe the normal force. I love your big brain, Tony. <laughs> yes yes there i do <laughs> um, what's the normal force kyle the normal force is apparently the the ground resisting things pushing down so when the ground pushes back that's apparently the normal force but does the ground push back that's a whole other ball game here i kind of see this whole buckled thing and the amount of resistance by the particles holding together. And so I've got one object that's being pushed downward. And then I've got these two particles, or we can say a lot of particles holding themselves together. And so it's this tension between those particles resisting this downward force. And that's what I call the normal force. It's not really pushing up. It's just these that bond holding these things together. Make sense? Hopefully. <laughs> I can see that it's challenging so, for him. Um, Tony, this is actually, this is a good one that uh, Blue had a, had a challenge with. Tony, can you help me understand, this is from Joshua Ellick, can you help me mm -hmm. understand the difference between gravity and gravitation? They're spelt differently. <laughs> Very astute. Uh, <laughs> um, no, they're, 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 ba they're, they're basically different ways of referring to the same thing. Um, yeah, you know, different. the force of gravity, gravitation, you know, um, it, they're, they're, they, they are um, largely synonymous. There are, there are kind of weird, um, weird uh, syntactic circumstances where you would use one word ahead of another, but, you know, the, it's not really like, they're, they're not actually different in any meaningful just, sense just where it sits in the in the sentence yeah maybe Damn, now, i feel i, I feel yeah, like we're totally vindicated at this point <laughs> that, <laughs> that's that exactly what you said we, blue yes essentially <laughs> the answer we get <laughs> <laughs> there you go uh, delco's man says the whole point of science is the opposite of what flatties say it's so that you don't have to repeat every experiment and you can build off of past tests. That's a great point. Who was it that said he stood on the shoulders of giants? It was Newton. I oh. think he said that if he sees further, it's because he stood on the shoulders of giants. Yeah. Well, uh, that, that's the whole purpose that. of my videos. There is, I started my whole channel so I would have to, so I could finally stop repeating myself over and over and over again. I kept having the same conversations with different people, having the same arguments, and I just got tired of it. I'm like, I'm just going to make one video, and then call it good. And that way, that can do all the repeating for me. So, all right, uh, Saeed Ahmed is asking Tony. Uh, he wants you to spell color. Uh, C-O-L-O-U-R. Ooh, wow. 
wrong. Uh, but by just a show of hands, who agrees that he just spelled it wrong? <laughs> Blue? Nothing. Okay, all right. All right, all right there we go. Allure. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, John, John Rapp, uh, I don't know what's this. Is this for normal? It says, uh, perhaps the hand on scale analogy. Yeah. So, so when you, one of the ways of demonstrating weight, for instance, is to, is to, is to get a scale that's on the ground or push on it, or you can hold it between your hands and, you know, um, push with one hand or push with the other hand and you'll see both ways you get a weight. So this is, this is what I was saying about weight not actually being the downward force of you on the scale. It's the upward force of the scale keeping you where you are. Those damn forces. They just love to show up in pairs, don't they? Yeah. And uh, the, that, that's the, uh, again, I, I, I want to, I want to come back. You going downwards, that's not a force, but something stopping you from going downwards, that requires a force, right? That's, and that's, that's um, the whole buckling thing here uh, that yeah, I was talking yeah. about. It's either going to hold together and resist yeah, that that's force, right. and, or it's going to buckle and it's going to fall through. And you're the first flat earther I've come across who I think understands that there is such a thing as material strength that can yield um, if the force on it is sufficiently great. You can't walk across tissue paper for precisely that reason. The downward force is sufficient that the structural integrity of the surface won't hold. So it's not um, necessarily the, it's not necessarily putting a force <coughs> upward. It's just yeah, it's it's ver, it's horizontal well, is what I'm trying to say. It's well, there's a um, yeah, it is horizontal in the in the, in the plane of the sheet. But there's a there's a sufficient discontinuity. You get beyond the stress. There's a thing called stress, um, and the the stress gets beyond the yield stress of the material. And once that happens, it, it will deform catastrophically. Um, and in the, in, in the case of tissue paper, it falls apart, it rips apart. But anyway. Yeah. Very cool. Um, <clears throat> it, it seems that the, the, the Egyptian reincarnated gods, Ra Thoth, is indeed going to show up this time. Uh, Excellent. Which it, he's he's a little skittish, gotta say. Okay. Um, <clears throat> he he insists that in five minutes he's going to destroy me. Okay. So that should be amazing. Um, I I for one have long waited for for this spectacle to occur. So. <laughs> uh, so anyway, um, <clears throat> there it is. Uh. So that's in just over 15 minutes. I, just just quickly. Yes. I want to I want to ask I want to ask Carl. So do you feel that you've learned anything in this discussion? Because I or, or do you feel that I've given you the opportunity to go and look up stuff and learn more? I've definitely learned something about the Cavendish experiment that I didn't know before. Before entering this whole thing, I wasn't entirely sure exactly how it worked. I've heard of the Cavendish experiment, but I'd never really had this opportunity to kind of get the this kind of a close-up experience with it. Does that make sense to ask these kind of questions? Uh, there's a couple other YouTube videos about that, and I just had a brief uh experience with one video that kind of talked about it a little bit, but seeing this experiment differently uh, was a different experience. So I don't know. It, I was able to learn more about that. That's the, the end game here, what I was able to learn. All right. Cool. Blue, anything, uh, anything you got to add? Uh, no, at this point, uh, I don't think so. All right. Well, uh, I think we've uh, probably beaten the horse to death. Now. <laughs> I think so too. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, to, to blue. That is, I, it is a fantastic apparatus. Um, it, it really is astonishing. It is just such an immense achievement. And again, hats off blue. Just congratulations to you. That is yeah, well done. Absolutely astounding. Um, well, thank you, Tony. I really appreciate that. John Rapp says he's sorry he meant a, a same as a static mass on a scale. 
static mass on a scale. For the hand on scale analogy, he means a static mass. I think right. it's, it's the same. Something it's the same. Yeah, it's generally. the same general discussion. Yeah. Effed up worlds. A shout out to Kyle Adams. Do you know? Do you know Joe? Uh, it Joe, rings a bell. Joe Hill. Joe Hill. Effed up world. Sounds it definitely yeah. rings a bell. So. so well. All right. Thank you to uh, to Blue to Tony. To, to Kyle, uh, I hope that uh, we can all uh, move forward on this and have some better, uh, some better understanding. So I also hope that that Javante, it's, it's actually his name is Javante, shows up. And I've got right here the very, very expert shirt that just showed up today. See that? There it is. Um, all right. <clears throat> <laughs> on my Teespring store. Uh, that's what we have for everybody. We'll see you uh, shortly in um, hopefully with the next one here. Uh, but otherwise, thanks a lot, everybody, and we'll catch you next time. Bye. Yeah, thank you. Bye. See you, everybody.